At the time, I was 21. I lived in a larger small city in the Midwest. At the time, I had no car, a bicycle, and hardly enough money for the public buses. I worked at a retail battery, lighting, and repair store. I worked full-time and only lived a little over a mile from my job. Since I was a female in a male-dominated field, I was often used to targeted abuse from men that thought they knew better. Many times I stood my ground and flaunted my knowledge in subjects that these men couldn't grasp. Because of my willingness to learn and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, mostly by myself. This time I wasn't the person closing and had a co-worker, Joey, who came in for a part-time shift after he wrapped up classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other and stood in when we were flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. Joey received a phone call for a possible repair on a smartphone and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair. He asked the young female caller to stop by for a consult. She had quickly agreed and said that she would stop by at around 5.30 p.m. This was a night that I was supposed to get done at 6 p.m. and catch the bus at 6.12. It was a windy, drizzly early fall night. I remember this because I had my bike with me and it became my anchor that night. A little before 6 p.m., this frantic, terrified, bawling, 19 to 20 something year old woman came into our tiny shop. I was at the counter switching out aging price tags and general store maintenance. I looked up at her confused and willing to help. She looked me deep in the eyes, asking if Joey was there. At the time he was in our tiny bathroom in the back, so I had to step in and help out any customers. I told her that he was currently busy and that I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed cheap phone very timidly. My customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend had gotten angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the backing off of the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair. No results found. I tried to hand her back the destroyed phone and she pushed it back in my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking commenced. There was this light drizzle outside, so our front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over. I couldn't see who was honking out there. I told her again that I couldn't help, and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks, and I was freaked out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her, and the honking would not stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point. I myself was in a domestic abuse situation at the time, and I knew what this girl was experiencing. I broke my locked stare at her and tried to look in our system a second time for a replacement screen. Nothing again. I looked up from our computer and saw a shadowy figure of a young man pacing in front of the store. I was just happy that the honking stopped, but I was increasingly shooken up. My whole body vibrated with fear, and I whispered across the counter if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter and said that I couldn't do that. She begged me not to. At this point, Joey came out from the back. He asked what all the honking was from. We had a lot of elderly, farmers, lazy, and disabled customers that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars. He thought it was one of those situations, but with the looks on our faces, he knew something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. Joey took the girl's phone from my hands and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee only doors. I did what I was told and grabbed my bag, my bike, and my jacket. I looked at the clock in the back and it read 6.14. I spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle, non-conforming, short but stocky Asian guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond either of two ways, like a doormat or ready to stand my ground. I knew that I couldn't fight a customer and neither could Joey, not because of physical reasons, 
we'd lose our jobs and had no idea what to do. The young guy threw the door open and the wind kept it that way. He had this manic, hateful look about him. He was a total predator. He was slim but muscular, early to mid-twenties, and was soaked by the rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and took the girl in tow. He hurled insults at us, and I gave the girl a pitied look. He slammed the door shut, and both Joey and I stood in absolute silence. Joey snapped out of it and ran to the front door and locked it. I told Joey to call our manager from our store landline, and I stood around while he did. I noticed that the guy had moved his truck to directly in front of our door. He was watching us from his truck, watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave to get home. The last possible bus came at 6.42, and I couldn't pedal my way home in the weather and because of all the circumstances that had just occurred. The time was around 6.18, and I just needed to cross the busy highway and down the sidewalk by an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy, and I played the waiting game. It was 6.23 when the dickhead finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 6.25 so I could arrive at the stop safely. Joey opened the front door, and I threw myself on top of my bike and pedaled harder than I could ever imagine. Now, mind you, our store was in an industrial shopping area at the very edge of town. We worked next to a sub shop and worked across from a strip mall with a bullseye store and a local chain grocery store with other retail stores and a bank all in that large lot. It started to downpour and as I tried to pull out of our parking lot straddling my bicycle, I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop the highway had dual lanes each way, and I had to play real-life Frogger if I wanted to make it to my destination in one piece. There were a few cars that slowed down for me as I hauled ass to the other side of the road. I jumped off my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off. My front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip, and my right foot had slipped off of the pedal. My shin had struck the pedal and I had to act quickly. I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck pulled into the bank parking lot of which I just passed. The truck pulled around and went out through the entrance across from the sub shop and took the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping center. There were three ways to get into that parking lot, one to the left one in the center, and the other far to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalks since it felt safer and was in front of people. The truck patrolled the parking lot, the hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and cornered, just like an injured animal. There were a couple of cars that pulled into the left entrance of the parking lot causing the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the shitty small bus stop, and I felt my phone buzz. I saw that it read Joey, so I rested my bike on my person to answer the call. Joey told me that he was watching, and even though he had an elderly couple in the store that he was helping, that he wouldn't allow the guy to hurt me. I started to cry. All of this had just gotten to me. The red truck looped around once again, and again. I saw the bus pull up early at 6.39, and I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver since I used the buses to get around town, errand, shopping, and to get to and from work. I had my stupid fucking bike to worry about. I hung up the phone with Joey, putting my phone in my jacket pocket, and strapped down my bike in the rack that was in front of the bus. I struggled since I was shaking, and my bike was slick from the rain. I got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors. I saw that the truck took a left at the center entrance of the lot. I could finally let my guard down. I sat at the front of the bus and my hands shook as I was trying to get the dollar fifty for the fare. The driver said that it was okay and that I could take my time with the change. I kept my backpack on and pulled my damp phone from my pocket dialing Joey's number, letting him know that I was fine. 
In under 15 minutes, I made it to my apartment, safe, but deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. All of this planted the idea in me to leave my own domestic abuse situation a few months later when the pandemic took the world by storm. To this day, I wonder about that girl. I hope that somebody more daring and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser, that she had the strength to leave that violent man, for her to write her own story and to recover from all of it. I'm currently doing significantly better in life and finally have my own car, and I live a couple of states away safely from my past life. So, even though it's been three years now, to that violent, abusive man, let's not meet again. So I've been a huge fan of this and other similar Reddit pages for years now, and finally have a fitting story of my own. For a quick bit of backstory, myself, my brother, and disabled mother all lived together in a trailer about 30 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee. I was wary of moving there at first for the stereotypes you may hear about trailer parks, but luckily we've had zero issues in the 10 years we've been here. Very nice neighbors, well-kept yards, and everything else. Okay, story time. So about a week ago, we were finally putting up our Christmas tree, drinking probably too much beer, listening to Christmas music, Christmas spirit in full swing. During our random banter, my brother says, Oh yeah, I can't believe I forgot to tell you. Earlier today at work, the owner had to kick out some guy who was acting really creepy. My brother works as the stalker at a family-owned little market about a mile from our home. He went on to tell me this younger-looking guy was pacing the aisles, sometimes standing still for minutes at a time, and not responding when the owner would ask if he needed help finding something. After about 20 minutes of this, the owner asked him to please leave because he was scaring the customers, and without a word, he left. We continue with our good time, hanging ornaments, drinking, getting our mom involved, and all is good. We wrap up around 10.30pm, help our mom to bed, and decide we might as well finish off the ton of beer we have left and admire our decked out tree. Around 11.30, we decide to go out on the front porch to share a cigarette, as we usually do when we've tied on a good buzz. My brother opens the door and almost immediately closes it. I ask what's up, and he says, Holy shit. The guy I was telling you about, just like Michael Myers, walked down the street past our house. I thought that was pretty strange, but wasn't really concerned. We waited for a few minutes, then went and smoked as usual, and went back inside. My brother and I aren't troublemakers at all, but I am pretty confident in our ability to defend ourselves if we had to. At this point, these are just thoughts in the back of my mind, though after all, I hadn't even seen this guy yet. Fast forward to about 2 a.m. We are more than drunk enough to go ahead and call it a night after one more cigarette. My brother opens the door and within seconds I hear him say, whoa, 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 hey man, you good? Hey buddy, what's up? You good? I'm in the kitchen at the time, but quickly decide this doesn't sound right and rush over to the door. What I see when I get to the open door is a younger man standing on our deck about three feet from our front door. He's pretty tall, about six foot four, and another thing I notice is that he looks a lot like Adam Driver, which was a detail my brother jokingly mentioned earlier during tree time. So I'm realizing for the first time, this must be the guy he's been talking about. One thing my brother must not got close enough to notice at work though, was this guy's eyes. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've never seen anything like it. His body language wasn't super menacing, but his eyes were the strangest combination of wide-eyed bewilderment and fury, like us opening our front door confused him and also made him very, very angry. I joined my brother in explaining to him that it's late and he should head home. After what I'd say was about 30 seconds of staring, he just walked off without a word. I peeked out of our blinds to make sure he really left, 
and saw nothing. We both tried to laugh it off and were saying things like, Well, that was pretty weird, huh? But it took a while for my adrenaline to taper off. The thing I kept thinking to myself that bothered me was those 30 seconds to me felt like he was the one deciding what the next move would be. But what that could have been, I have no idea. I also didn't love that my brother said when he opened the door, he was already standing there. So, for how long? We calmed down by watching YouTube videos, and after another 30 minutes or so, I say to my brother, Okay man, let's just go to bed. I'll take one more look outside to be safe. But felt like it wasn't really necessary. I open the door, and he's back. The street lights are spaced very far apart in our trailer park, but at the edge of our driveway, there, I see his silhouette, probably 50 feet away, just staring at our front door. I feel I should mention he's not there texting or on the phone with someone. He's just there. I feel bad in hindsight, because I'm sure this poor guy definitely has mental health issues, but between being drunk and exhausted and the look he gave us earlier, I was over it. I finally put some bass in my voice and said, Hey man, you can't just stand in our driveway. You're being creepy, dude. Just please leave. I really don't want to call the cops on you, so don't make me. This seemed to work. His demeanor didn't change at all, but the word cops seemed to do the trick. He turned around and walked away. I hope we handed it well. I understand and empathize with people with mental health problems and have friends and family who unfortunately suffer from those things. However, I still can't shake the feeling that something bad could have happened that night. He didn't finally leave our porch earlier that night until I showed up to the door, essentially making him outnumbered. And even then, he still came back. I hope he's okay out there. We haven't seen him since. I also hope not calling the police wasn't a bad choice and that he isn't out there with bad intentions on somebody else's front deck at 2am who lives alone or is elderly. I wish I could have figured out what that was all about, but during every interaction my brother and I had with him that day and night, he never spoke a word. That's pretty fucking creepy. My unit in the US Army was deployed to Iraq in April of 2006. We were in Ramadi. It was 123 kilometers out of Baghdad. I was in a Humvee headed to Baghdad for emergency leave due to a death in my family. It was close to midnight. The Humvee I was in had three others and a turret gunner. There were two other Humvees too, with a total of five people in as well. One in front and one in the back. I was without a weapon due to my leave. Suddenly, the Humvee in front stopped hard. We all figured it was a possible IED or VB IED. The team leader in our Humvee radioed to the lead Humvee. The conversation went along these lines. What's up? Why did you stop? Something flew in front of the Humvee. What? Flew in front of the Humvee. Yes. We didn't see anything. And the third Humvee piped in. Does anyone hear that helicopter? Yes, yes, but I don't see it. Did the other two vehicles? Just then, in the desert off the highway, was a black figure that looked like a huge bird. It looked like smoke was emitting from it, a blackish-greenish smoke with a bit of blue tinge. We all focused our eyes. The two troops with better night vision could see something, but they couldn't make out what it was. The smoke was distorting the view. Within a second or two, a rock was thrown at one of the Humvees, a big rock, like the size of a head. We all froze. Due to rules of engagement, we couldn't just light it up. We used a spotlight, and in that light, something just flew straight up, and it was loud. And then we heard a loud screeching noise. Within a minute, it was over. We all sat there in a state of shock, curiosity, and panic. What the fuck was that? When we got to Baghdad, 
The translator that they were picking up to bring to the marines that was with us said, Sounds like you encountered an Ifrit. A team leader said, A what? An Ifrit. A winged djinn. He responded. We were all a bit speechless. We chose not to disclose this winged thing to our command. Instead, we reported it as battle fatigue, now known as PTSD. If we had told them, we knew it would have been a career killer. It's been 13 years since this happened. I met my now husband in 2015, and he had also been deployed to Ramadi with my sister unit at the time, and he had gone through this particular stretch of highway on his mid-deployment leave. He recounted a similar story to me. It was enough to stop me in my tracks. Considering the time we were there was very deadly, including an aid station manned by soldiers that was ambushed and blown to bits. I was a medic, so death was my norm. I still can't wrap my mind around it, and now apparently, the last two places I've lived in, something has followed us. A few days ago, I came home from work and spent some time playing with my kids in the front yard. I live in a typical suburb with very little crime. At about 8.45pm, it was pretty dark and it was time for them to go to bed, so we started collecting frisbees, balls, and toys. At some point, my daughter entered the garage and I went after her. My son, who was 11 years old, remained outside on the driveway by the sidewalk. It must have been 10 to 15 seconds that he was out of my sight when a dark car appeared out of nowhere and stopped right by my mailbox, just feet away from my son. I was distracted in the garage and had not seen this. I came out of the garage and when the driver saw me, he accelerated and took off at a high speed. It was all very quick. Why would he stop when he saw my son alone? and then escape when he saw me. Was he just lost, or was he trying to snatch a kid? I don't want to be paranoid, but TV is full of true crime shows with people saying, this has never happened before in our town. My now husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive, apartment complex in a sort of nice part of town. We're on the third floor with a large balcony that looks out onto the courtyard in which other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, you can see the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants and the open stairwells. A year went by without a hitch. My husband works at a bar so he comes home late while I usually make it home at around 5pm. It's easy to get to any apartment doorway, as the complex is large and open with no security doors except the door to the apartment. It started in August 2016. I would be home after work, chilling and watching TV almost always around 9.30. I could hear someone come up the stairs. Things would be quiet, and all of a sudden, loud sharp knocks on my door. I didn't move because it was startling, but eventually I went to go look at the peephole. There stood three people, all with black hoodies on, all seemingly staring at the peephole like they could see me. I did not answer the door, and after a while they left. Cue a few weeks later. It's the same time, but this incident, footsteps and then loud hard bangs on the door, that sent my cat flying to hide. I sat, frozen, but said to myself, maybe it's the police. I made it to the people once again, this time staring out at one person, a dark hoodie, male, white, and very, very gaunt, with huge black eyes. Again, I did not answer the door and grabbed a kitchen knife that I kept by my side until my husband came home. This continued for weeks and once when my husband was home. He proceeded to look through the peephole, saw the same man and screamed for him to leave, and he did. We called maintenance and the police 
who both stated that they would do regular patrols, but there was nothing else they could do, and suggested cameras. Everything stopped for a while, maybe six months, during the winter, which helped me be at ease, because when all of this was happening, I was having a very hard time sleeping, and stopped going out at night. However, I assumed the same man started up again, except this time, the same large bangs on the door would happen, but when I would look out of the peephole, no one was there. I then became horrified as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door, like someone was standing and waiting. Again, I reported it. Security stepped up in the area, but I still did not feel safe. I was hoping it would just stop as I felt tortured in my own home, but as I realized two weeks ago, things could be much worse. At night to go to bed, I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant glass sliding door that led out to our balcony. It was late at night, the lights were off in the apartment. As I walk by, I glance over and across the courtyard. I see the same man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way from the second to third floor, staring right at my balcony just standing there, unmoved, facing in the direction of me. The same man who was at my door. I went numb, heart racing, chilled to the bone. I knew he couldn't have seen me because the lights were off and the stairway had lights of its own, but I was still scared shitless. I called my husband who rushed over, but the man had left. More reports to the front office more promised security patrols. This same creepy dead-eyed man in the black hoodie continued to stand at the stairway landing, staring at my apartment. It has now been two weeks, and he does this every Friday. I am horrified and have been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and strangling me in my sleep. So, creepy black-eyed man, please, let's not ever meet. Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga, had a beautiful girlfriend, the works. He seemed very balanced and healthy. His name was Andrew. We had another longtime co-worker who was sort of Mr. Popular with managers, but honestly, really annoying. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, his name was Brad. Now, before I explain, I should include that this workplace sucks. It barely holds a single star on Indeed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly a year into Andrew's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friendly to one another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things, but something was really out of place when he mentioned his new beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him, who was really rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's trolling. Fast forward a few weeks, Andrew has seemingly took a lot of interest in co-worker Brad and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in a more endearing way, kind of copying his silly dances and laughing. It seemed harmless, but as months go past, he continued to dance more and more, to the point he had to be asked to stop by supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings, using all the same mannerisms and phrases as Brad. This really started to creep out Brad, to the point he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but Andrew was very vocal against all substance use, including alcohol and weed and such. He was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when Brad ends up getting with a new hire at work. 
she ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together and such. This is when Andrew shows up to work using Brad's name, even signing himself in on the logbook as him, referring to himself as Brad all morning. Then, later that day, Andrew stands up on a work table, screaming that he's in love with Brad's girlfriend, his arms spread out in a cross Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place was silent, and after, he ended up standing in a corner with a broom, sweeping nothing for the next several hours. He would not turn around from the corner, not even when tapped on the shoulder or called by name. The only time I saw him away from that corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last in the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him. He was looking directly at me, head tilted down, making a pseudo snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided Andrew needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him in an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guards who I was friends with told me Andrew kept showing up in the middle of the night, trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 to 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, Andrew comes back and seems somewhat normal, almost like he has no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wacky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with Andrew, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me, go for a hike and throw axes at trees and stuff like that. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I'd get back to him on that, as I was secretly a bit on edge. He asked me later in the day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations. And he said, well, I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then. And I laughed, not knowing how to react at all. I told the manager about that, and he kind of just scratched his head uncomfortably and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, Andrew ends up finding Brad's address due to a work get-together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to Andrew. They eventually find rocks and sticks and weird formations on their doorstep like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was Andrew. Things got really weird when they actually found Andrew looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out Brad's name, repeatedly whispering, Brad, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire Andrew. Four years later, Andrew still stalks Brad's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends a message to each one of us as well, saying, Hey, it's Brad from work. So I guess my question is what would this behavior be called? And how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would your diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he doesn't seem to, but he sure remembers Brad's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one and the only one. I'm the bigger one. She's the smaller one, is a quote. He said that he was put on this earth to essentially save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from family or anything and is working a new job, living alone unattended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. Anyway, I'm interested in some of your feedback in what he might be dealing with. I'm Evie, 
I wanted to tell my story because it was absolutely terrifying at the time. It all started the morning of February 14th, 2018. I was in middle school and the campus was buzzing with life. Guys were running around with gifts for their girlfriends. Girlfriends gave gifts to their boyfriends. Friends exchanged candies. All in all, everything seemed normal. I wasn't popular per se, but I knew everyone and everyone knew me. But I preferred to hang around with a small group of close friends because being around too many people made me anxious. During lunch, I was hanging around my usual group of friends, which consisted of two girls, Alex and Mia, and three guys, Nico, Adrian, and Elijah. Valentine's Day of all days made me even more anxious because a lot of people would join our group because of my friend Adrian. He attracted a lot of girls, and my friend Mia was such a sweetheart, and a lot of guys wanted to date her. I began to feel overwhelmed so I slipped out of my group and headed to a secret hiding place, which was just a bench that was way out in the field, sort of hidden by some trees. No one really went there, so it was a good place to catch my breath. As I was reading my book, I hear someone getting closer. I look up and see this guy, Emmanuel. When I saw Emmanuel, I instantly started to freak out, because he always seemed to have this sort of infatuation with me. Every day, he would force himself on me, randomly hugging me, trying to kiss me, telling me he liked me. And believe it or not, I would often see him around my neighborhood. I decided to play it cool and continued reading, when he suddenly just grabs my book out of my hands. Hey, what the hell, man? I yelled, and he simply responded with, Sorry, I just wanted your attention. I was still angry but I tried to calm myself down. What do you want? I said. I really like you, and I want you to be my girlfriend. And I swear, I'll treat you like a queen. After he said that, he handed me a box of chocolates and a cute stuffed bear. I thought it was a nice gesture, but I really felt uncomfortable whenever he was around. So I told him that even though it was sweet of him, I was already in a relationship, which obviously wasn't true. When the words left my mouth, he turned from being nice and calm to angry. He yelled at me, saying how dare I date someone that wasn't him. I tried to get up to leave, but he tightly grabbed my arm and forcefully kissed me. I tried pushing him off, but he was stronger than me, so I yelled for help at the top of my lungs and he quickly covered my mouth. So I bit his hand and kicked him in the balls. While he was shocked, I broke free and ran to my friend group. He yelled behind me, saying how he would assault me and then kill me. Obviously the duty guards heard this and immediately took action. But I just wanted to get to the safety of my group. So I kept running until I bumped into Adrian. I hugged him and cried my eyes out. He comforted me until I was ready to talk. I told him everything, and then I was suddenly called into the principal's office. They wanted to know everything that had happened, and the police were called. It was a long day, and I just wanted to go home. After I told them what happened, I was allowed to leave for home early. I later found out that in his house, there was a shrine built for me, with pictures of me doing various things, walking with my dog eating in my living room with my family, even of me changing. It was horrible and traumatizing. This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy gated community in Orange County, California. It's called Kodo de Katza. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it typically is domestic violence within a household. 
I am now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. I always questioned this policy, asking, what's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. Anyways, one night, one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m. after having fallen asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door, thinking it's my sister or me needing help. He opens the door without looking through the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is his house and not the kid's. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with a very frustrated and angry kid to no avail, and it's escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this house isn't his, and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now, let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work and such. He's actually still much stronger than me, as evident whenever we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, the kid, in a fit of rage, decides to barge his way into the house, and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid, and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and are terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he's pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decide to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid is able to break in. My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next. She described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard banging on one of the back doors and they have to taste the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts, he got confused on what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but my parents said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows, in a gated community, was quite upsetting to them. The psychological after-effects of this ordeal are pretty apparent as they're coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive, high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but they just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting.
Hey everyone, this took place in the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down this story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So, every summer in my city, my friends and I like to make small campfires in chill, secluded areas, because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fees to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hang to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about though are bears because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m. I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get there. The spot I get to has a two minute paved walkway I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway are two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge slash the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit and whatever else. I get to the spot, and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during hot summers. So I set up the chair, and I get to digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large, like a two-hand-sized rock. I'm confused, because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water, even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water, and I don't see anything. I kind of brush it off, thinking I'm just hearing things, but as I keep shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I'm thinking something is falling from above, because logically something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above where some trees are above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out. Hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately but there was no bear or signs of anything for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies before, and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So I shine my flashlight over to the area again, and as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress, because honestly, of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-forties, shaved, not bald, and mediumish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my stuff and get the hell out of there, because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me and briskly walk up to the small ramp, and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest, and I'm frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in my crocs, mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd not regret being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point, and a sense of relief starts setting in, knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he was a primate walking. 
His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet and positions his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man starts running towards me. I book it. I run as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it. But I didn't care because a whole naked ass man was chasing me at 11 at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest and I run to my car which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get into my car and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my car. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead, but I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock the doors, and throw my things into my back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, it most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I'm fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was still coming. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me. I zoom out of the area as fast as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends, calling me to ask me if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because, again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story the way I just told it now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that, and I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with it hanging out. But as we're just talking out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful, there's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds, saying, Oh, damn, really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. All I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said they would make note of it anyways, in case it happens again. Some of my friends say it's a skinwalker, Others say more realistically it's either a homeless, mentally ill, or a drunk slash high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on my past version because honestly, if time travel is real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So that is the only crazy let's not meet story I have, but damn, is it a story I will never forget. This is the story of a co-worker I had a long time ago, so I can look back on it and laugh now, but at the time, it was really distressing for me. To give some context, every summer I would do some temp work for the company where my dad worked. It was an education company, so they always needed temp workers around July and August time for all of the exam remarks that they had come in. It was data entry work, but it suited me fine and it meant I could earn a little extra cash while I was at university. I did this every summer from when I was about 19 right through to when I was 23, and then I got another job at the same company for a bit after I graduated, but we'll get onto that later. For now, all you need to know is that I was a reasonably familiar face there, and everyone knew I was my dad's daughter. 
The main downside of working there was that I'd clock off work at 5 p.m., but I'd have to wait for my dad to finish work since he was the head of an entire department, so he'd end up staying there a bit later. Every day, I'd bring a book with me and sit in this little foyer area between his department and the department where I worked since it had the most comfortable chairs. I must have been 22 years old when this happened because it was the penultimate summer that I worked there. I had just had my hair cut short for the first time in my life, and I dyed it red as well. I was sitting on these couches, reading, when all of a sudden, this guy approaches me. He tells me that he works in my dad's department, and he thought he'd come introduce himself. His name is Leon. This was a pretty common occurrence for me, and I was aware of this guy. He was young and decent looking, so a few of the women in my department had a crush on him. I was dating someone at the time though, and I'd never actually seen him in person, but I could see what they saw in him. We got to chatting, and he mentioned that I changed my hair, so I told him about cutting it short, and he cut me off mid-sentence. This is where it started to get weird. He said, No, first it was brown, and you didn't have a fringe. Then you went through a phase of curling it. Then you put the fringe in and dyed it red. After that, you dyed it purple. Now you've had it cut short and dyed it back to red. This guy I had just met was describing over two years worth of hairstyle changes that I'd had. I felt creeped out, but he seemed like a nice enough guy, and I guess I'd worked there at the company throughout the entire time, so it was reasonable to assume that he'd noticed me before. That should have been the first red flag. He asked me if I had Facebook, and I told him that I did so he said he would add me. That seemed pretty normal, but then, after he sent me the friend request, he asked me to get my phone out so he could watch me accept the friend request. I'm British, and it's therefore impossible for me to be impolite, so I got out my phone and showed him that I had accepted it. I thought that might calm him down, but bear in mind, he wasn't a bad-looking guy, so I felt a bit flattered at this point that he was so keen on me. That sense of flattery dissolved real fast. After the Facebook thing, he kept asking me if I had MSN, and I told him that I didn't. I swear, throughout this conversation, he asked me if I had MSN about four times. Then, the final time he asked, he was like, Please can you get MSN so we can chat after work? It was like he had something really urgent he wanted to tell me. But I had only just met this person. I kind of laughed and said about how I hadn't used MSN since I was a teenager, without necessarily rejecting him. Then he said something like, Well, if you don't have MSN, then do you have Skype? This seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring up my boyfriend, who was a foreign student and went back to his home country during the summer. He was the only person I spoke to on Skype. I said to Leon about how I didn't have my own Skype account, but I used my dad's Skype account to talk to my boyfriend. I really thought this might ward him off. I was wrong. Without missing a beat, he said, Can you please just get your own Skype account so we can video chat after work? He said it like I was somehow inconveniencing him. Like this was something we'd agreed to months ago or something. I had no idea how to react so I just sort of smiled and laughed. Thank the heavens someone from my dad's department walked past at that moment and was like, Leon, aren't you meant to be at your desk? He scurried off pretty quickly after that, but not before reminding me to get my own Skype account and send him the details. I told my dad about the whole exchange in the car ride home, but all he said was that Leon was very friendly and that a lot of women in his department liked him, so maybe I had just misunderstood the situation. I thought he was probably right, so I tried not to let it bother me. Later that evening, however, I was on my computer doing university work when a message popped up on my Facebook. It was Leon. All the message said was, We like the same movies. I don't know what it was, but something about this message freaked me out so much. I decided not to respond and logged off of Facebook, hoping that he wouldn't notice I'd been online. The next day after work, I was sat in my usual spot when Leon comes over to me. His face was like thunder. 
At first, I thought he was just having a bad day and was walking through the hallway, but my heart dropped when I realized he was walking directly towards me. Why didn't you respond to my Facebook message? I was stunned. How was I supposed to respond to that? Who says stuff like that in real life? Lucky for me, I didn't have an opportunity to respond because he started off on this tirade. I'm not even kidding. He started listing all of the movies we had in common that he'd seen on my Facebook profile. Batman The Dark Knight, Watchmen, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, Fight Club. I just sat there watching him reel off all these film titles. Once he was finished, all he said was, It's okay, I forgive you and then walked off back to his department. Over the next couple of weeks, he came and found me in my spot every day and talked at me from the moment I sat down to the moment my dad came to get me. I don't remember many of the other exchanges, but I do remember distinctly one day pretending to pick my nose when I saw him coming to see if it would put him off. It didn't. It got to the point where I'd get so stressed out after work that I'd go and hide in the toilets for as long as I could, but the women I worked with started to notice and think that I was weird. Eventually, I broached the subject with my dad, and he gave me his car keys after my shift so that I could go hide out in his car rather than in the building. So I'm camped out in his car, and I'm still feeling quite tense, but after about 20 minutes, I start to feel at ease. Surely he won't come looking for me out here. Wrong. I look over at the main entrance, and my heart drops. He's coming out of the door, and he's scrutinizing all of the cars. I sank down as far as possible into my seat, but I wasn't fast enough, and he saw me. He comes rushing towards me and starts tapping on the glass, so I open the door and ask him what's up. I didn't see you in your usual spot, but luckily the doorman Chris told me he saw you come out here. Why are you in your dad's car? Again, what are you supposed to say to that? I told him I had a headache, so I'd come out to the car to take some paracetamol and see if I could get some sleep. At least he respected that, because he told me to feel better and then left me alone. I breathed a sigh of relief knowing that I was only going to be working there for a few more days before I had to go back to university. I told my dad about the car incident, and he gave Leon a talking to the next day. Leon would still come find me in the foyer, but he'd only talk to me for a few minutes in passing before leaving me alone. It was a big relief. On my last day at work there, I was fully expecting him to do something crazy, but he didn't even come to chat with me that day. I left the office and thought I would never see him again. I found out he was fired not long after I left the company that year because he kept coming into work late and then spent most of his time at work chatting with his co-workers and me, apparently. Fast forward to January of 2014 and I was preparing to move to China for a position teaching English. I had graduated from university and I was working at the same company, but this time in a semi-permanent capacity. It was my last day at work, so I received quite a few gifts and some fuss from my co-workers. It was about 10 a.m. when who should I see walk through the door but Leon. He had been hired as a temp to do the job that I'd done for so many years. As soon as he walked through the door, he saw me and this flash of recognition crossed his face. I wanted to slide under my desk and die. He came walking over to me and was all smiles, asking about how I was and what I was still doing at the company. It was at this point that one of my co-workers mentioned about how I was off to China soon. Leon seized on that and started talking about his friend who was also interested in TEFL. His interest seemed genuine, so I got to talking about how I got my TEFL qualification who I got it through, what company I was going to be working for out in China, and other stuff. We chatted for about 20 minutes, and he wrote down some details for his friend, then went off to work. At the end of the day, I was packing all of my stuff to leave, and a few of my co-workers were coming over to say their goodbyes. 
Don't get me wrong. The Leon incident aside, I had a wonderful time working at that company, and I made a lot of great friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Leon approaching, but I think, what's the harm? He says goodbye and wishes me luck on my new adventure. Then, as I'm literally walking out of the door of the department, I hear him call out, See you in China. For the first two weeks of my teacher training over there, I was like a hawk keeping a constant lookout for this guy. He never did follow me out to China, but it still remains as one of the creepiest encounters of my life. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home whether you're there to let them in or not. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I've never gotten used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background, cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things. Well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. My typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So, armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. And at this point, the dog was scratching on the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within the basement. At least this time I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time, I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. 
Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams, unlike anything I'd ever heard. Sounds that I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks, followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic, freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, Hello? Who's in there? There was no response. Just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response. Just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relief but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again the next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell lay beyond that door. By the time I returned, I had built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown, but there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I had nearly given up on solving the mystery when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Laura. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She'd moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask. But before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, A crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all. She'd actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, hi, as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got into a car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him. I entered the back door like I had so many months before. This time, something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged-looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make sense, but at this point, 
My desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, Meter Reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged. His head was shaved and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants but no shirt. What I remembered most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He became grimacing, and little verbal ticks started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out aloud, Aww, in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple of friends, including Laura, over at my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter, but as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me something she'd seen a couple of weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I'd like to think he got the help he needed. But maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. The non-profit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms and drinking was not allowed on site, nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So, I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact, that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay during the DNC convention of 08 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning, and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank across the city most of the day. By about 1 a.m., we got back to the hotel. The room was typical with two queen beds. Bed number one was close to a big window looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door slash entryway to our room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4 a.m. My wife was laying at the head of bed number two, flipping through the TV. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number one, staring out the window as we talked. 
As we talked, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I assumed it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by, and I thought I heard movement again, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. No, she replied. I thought I heard a door. I said back to her, with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said, breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quick. Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out, and I wanted to believe I wasn't seeing it. But there was a man, dressed in all black, with a black baseball cap, pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway, where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room, and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone and hadn't been for a while, and he knew we spotted him. Eventually, Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway, and he said, Hey man, is there something we can help you out with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little into the light and made eye contact with Tim and I. We all just stared at each other. Then eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. He stared at us for a while longer raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in a stairwell, but they directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk and they told him he was not a guest. He was apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then, a while later, they told my wife he disappeared, and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They told her there wasn't even a room 1709 in the hotel. We got three different stories. We still have no idea what that was all about, or how he managed to get a keycard to our room. We were sure the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life. Always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. We should have sued, but we were young and dumb. I still feel sick to my stomach and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. Anyway, here it goes. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive so I only do rescues in my area or in the relative nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods. That's animals with pouches or marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went. Hell, why not? I got my rescue tub, which contains my essentials, and went on my way. The couple that called in the rue were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs like to play together, 
and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trust them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late, and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no, and that I got this. My area is very safe, and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic, he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilograms, more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities, so I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in the tub. I tie it with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching, movements, hissing, growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time so I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago before I got sick, and when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right, and as sure as sure, every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I'm on the balls of my feet. I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut. I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy. I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way too big and there was sudden silence. Like whatever had made the noise, it stopped or was stalking. I decided to just fuck it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail, sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it, and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't give a fuck. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground. That was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are screaming to run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night, and the next day she came with me to try and find my rescue tub. This morning, another rescuer came to take the sick route to the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it. The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I'll be going out at night for a long, long while. Hi, my name is Anna and a few days ago Something happened that makes me sick. We moved to an east coast town about a year ago to be closer to family. So close in fact that my aunt, her wife, and my cousins are only a 10 minute walk from my house. Granted, we are very spaced out and borderline rural, 
Despite living about 15 minutes from the outskirts of a big city, I was walking my two little dachshunds back home from my aunt's house. My mom hates it when I'm alone the majority of the day, so I spend time at their house, and I was genuinely enjoying my time. It was cold, but quiet and oddly beautiful. I got home, fed my pups and two birds, and FaceTimed a friend. I was talking with them and doing chores, and was admittedly being loud and giggly when taking out the trash to the side of my house. I get back inside and lay down in bed, still chatting, when my bird starts calling at something. Now, anyone who has ever owned a parrot knows that they have distinct noises for certain movements. She's been in my family for 76 years and with me my whole life, so I knew the sound was alarm or intrigue. I brush it off as her seeing herself in the window reflection and go back to talking to my friend. I get up to get water and my back is to the sliding glass door, which is thankfully locked, and my friend has the wind knocked out of him. I'm confused and I think he's hurt. He tells me, Anna, go back to your room now. I scoff, but then I see it in my camera view. There is a man with his face and hands pressed up against the glass door. He's a middle-aged white guy in a gray pullover and dark pants and a grin on his face. My friend, ever the best in panicked situation, tells me, don't look at him, just go to your room. I was shaking so hard. I'm blubbering and decide to lock myself and my dogs in my closet. My parrot is still going crazy. English isn't my first language, and it's bad when I'm in a panicked state, so I revert back to my native language, which my friend doesn't know. Luckily, my friend knows how to take charge, and he tells me he'll be over in 10 minutes, and he calls the police. I'm thinking I can run to my mom's room and find a gun, so if the guy does come into the house, I can blow a quarter-sized hole in his chest. I'm debating getting up when I hear tapping on my window. It's slow and intentionally creepy. My dog starts barking. I'm ready to accept my death. I'm a teenage girl, home alone, and I'm about to die. Wait, my aunt should be leaving for work. I shoot her a quick text. The tapping stopped, and I think it's over, when I realize something that makes my heart drop. I left the front door unlocked when I took out the trash. This keeps getting worse, and I beg my friend to hurry. The tapping thankfully returns to my window, and I can only close my eyes and hope that someone gets here fast. It feels like an eternity, crying to another teen who's breaking multiple traffic laws. Never before have I been grateful to hear another man's voice yelling outside of my house at 1 a.m. It was my godsend neighbor. Apparently, his pregnant wife was having bad nausea and went out on the deck, and where it's situated, you can see my whole backyard. She got a bad feeling after seeing the unfamiliar man approach my door and woke her husband to check it out. I thank God every day for her because I think she saved my life. I let my neighbors into my house and my aunt arrives about four minutes later packing major heat. My friend not long after her. I go from home alone to an impromptu house party of concerned people. The police arrive like 10 minutes later like they didn't just take 30 minutes to arrive to the scene. On a brighter side, my bird wasn't too alerted by this encounter and went back to eating not five minutes later. And my dogs were just happy to see people. My friend has been staying the nights with me since. I'm finding it hard to be home alone, despite the fact that an arrest was made. I'm so thankful that my neighbor had such good instincts and that my aunt and friend were so quick on their feet, because this could have been a lot worse. I'm a girl living in Northern Europe. I won't go into too much detail where this happened because I don't want people to recognize me from this story. This story takes place in October when I had a part-time job in this research center. This was in a bigger city, 
Not like in the middle of nowhere, but it was a 30 minute bus ride from where I lived at the time. Keep in mind that the workplace was in an industrial estate, so the only people that really spent time in the area were the workers from these companies. I worked all three shifts, mornings, evenings, and nights. But I did mostly night shifts because none of my co-workers really wanted them. And I am a night owl anyway, so that 10pm to 6am shift worked well for me. This happened on one of these night shifts. It was a Thursday night, and I was one of the three workers there that night. We did not work together. We all were in our own departments, doing different kinds of work, all so far from each other in the building. I worked at a chem lab doing water analysis, so it was not any kind of customer service job. We were basically all alone, and it usually got really quiet and rather peaceful. We had no security guards, but it was quite impossible to enter the building without an identification card. All doors were locked, and everyone that worked there had these cards where you hold it in the sensor on the door and it opens. You also got to use the card when leaving the building. These locked doors were not only on the outside, but also inside the building. So if someone somehow managed to get through the first door without the card, they could not get any further into the building. To the labs, for example. The door locks again immediately after you get in or out. Considering that, we never really had to worry about someone uninvited getting in, even during the night time. This particular night, I took a bus and headed to work. I greeted my co-workers that were leaving as their shifts had just ended and met the other night shifters in the women's dressing room. All normal. I was in a good mood and so were my two co-workers. When our shift started, we parted our ways and went to different labs. I was three hours into my shift at 1am when I decided to take my 20 minute break. My other two co-workers had their breaks earlier than mine, so I was alone. Our break room was this lounge where there were a couple of long tables, chairs, a mini kitchen and a bathroom. I'm not gonna lie, this big hall with old flickering ceiling lights was not my favorite place to be alone at 1am when the whole building is almost empty and it's pitch black outside. There were big windows in the lounge, but I could not see anything out of them. Just darkness. There was always the same eerie vibe at night time, so I was used to it. Five minutes into my break, I decided to go outside to smoke a cigarette. I put a jacket on, took my shit with me, and opened the door with the card. We had this smoking place in the back of the parking lot, about a minute walk from the door. If I said I wasn't scared to be alone in an empty parking lot at night as a young girl, I would be lying. This was the only thing I really did not like about the night shifts, but I really needed that cigarette. Nothing bad had ever happened, and I live in a generally safe country, so I just hoped for the best. There was this nasty white plastic chair in the smoking place. I sat in it and lit my cigarette. From the smoking place, I could see clearly to the entrance of the building. There were bright lights above the door. Usually I just stared at that door without even noticing it. I mean it was at night in an industrial estate and there were not many interesting things to look at. All of a sudden, I noticed a person walking up to the door. It was a man with a trench coat and a top hat holding a briefcase. I had never seen this man before in my work or anywhere near this place. This man stood still in front of the door, not moving at all, facing the door. Even though nothing seemingly bad happened yet, just a weird man standing by the door. I cannot even explain in words how scared I was. I had to somehow get past this man to get back inside. He wasn't aware that I was there. He didn't see me. What if he does something to me when I'm trying to get inside? Is he even trying to get inside? What does he want? And who is he? This was the only door where I could enter the building from the outside, so I had no choice but to try and ignore that man at the door, and to attempt to get inside. What on earth is this weirdly dressed man doing in this area at 1am? 
There is clearly something he wants from us, and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to know what that was. I started walking towards the man and the door while he was still standing there, unaware that I'm behind him in the parking lot. The closer I got, the more scared I became. I had to stop and think again. I knew it was part of my job to confront unwanted people trying to get in and tell them how to contact our customer services, but keep in mind, this was at 1am. A weird man who appeared out of thin air and an 18-year-old girl alone. I had this gut feeling that I should not go to that door. I decided to call my co-worker that was there that night and ask if she could meet me at the door and let me in so I didn't need to face this man alone. I hid behind my co-worker's car that was in the parking lot to make the call. In the position I was hiding, I could still see this man through the car windows. I wanted to see if he would leave and where he would go. My co-worker answers the call, and when I start whispering on the phone and explaining the situation, I watch in horror as the man turns around and stares right at the car I was hiding behind. I don't think he saw me, but he for sure heard there was a woman talking behind this car. What happened next is straight from a horror film. When this man found out there was someone behind the car, he slowly and quietly approached, not knowing I could see him through the windows. And here's the thing, he did not walk, he did not run, he was on all fours crawling towards the damn car. I couldn't even scream. I just froze from fear and dropped my phone. When this man was getting closer to the car, I could see both of my co-workers opening the door, waving and screaming at me to run and come in. They didn't need to tell me twice. I ran inside so fast that the man didn't even have time to react. When he got up and started running after me, the door was already closed. The second he heard the door lock itself, he turned around and started speed walking away, eventually disappearing into the darkness. We called the police immediately and they arrived not long after. They didn't find anything or anyone. That man vanished as fast as he had appeared and no one has seen him since. After that shift, my co-workers walked me to the bus and waited with me until it arrived, making sure I got home safely. I am forever thankful to these lovely women for opening the door for me before that man got to me and did God knows what. I haven't done any night shifts after that and definitely never will. Three years ago, I was living with my then boyfriend in a one-bedroom apartment in a little mountain town. It was a half-basement unit, so the bottom of all of our windows were level with the ground outside. It was also an older apartment, and not all the windows could fully lock. One day, my boyfriend comes home from work while I'm laying on the sofa and immediately runs up to the window near me and looks out of it frantically. He then goes to look out every other window in the house then walks around the outside looking in the windows. When he comes back from this confusing exploit, I ask him what's going on and why he's doing that. I think I just walked up on a guy looking in the window at you. He took off as soon as I walked up, he tells me. This was naturally very unsettling, but after discussing it and considering the time of day and the number of people out and about around the complex at that time, we came to the conclusion that it was just a curious neighbor or someone passing by that happened to glance in. With that, we forgot about it. If only that was the end. For the next couple of months, odd stuff happened here and there. Someone would knock on the door occasionally, then when I went to answer, no one was there. I'd find things in my apartment that I wasn't familiar with, or things like clothing items would vanish. I didn't really think twice about any of it, until one night. My boyfriend and I were arguing at about one or two in the morning, and we were being a bit loud. We were standing in the kitchen face to face. 
His back was to an open window with the blinds up halfway, and I was facing it. Amidst our arguing, I glanced behind him at the window, thinking I saw the reflection of my face in it. The window was open. It wasn't my face. There was a man with his face pressed almost against the window screen, watching us. Given the fact that we were arguing and it was late, I thought for a moment it might have been a concerned neighbor walking up to the window to speak to us, so I spoke to him. Hello, can I help you? I asked a little aggressively, thinking a neighbor was intruding on our privacy. He responded to this by staring, unwavering and cold, right at me. His face did not change expression, he did not blink or move. He just looked right at me in a way I have never been looked at before or since. In this instant, I also realized that because of the window being level with the ground, the only way this man's face could be where it was was if he was laying on the ground outside the apartment or crouched and contorted to look into the window. My heart sank. I buried my face in my boyfriend's chest and closed my eyes in fear. My boyfriend, up to this point, thought I was messing with him. When I buried my face in his chest, only then did he say, Is there really someone at the window? I whispered, yes, to him. He felt my fear and took a moment before he turned around. By the time he did, the man was gone. It was at this point I started to think about all the odd little occurrences that I'd been experiencing. I assumed the worst. I filed a police report with his description, and my brother loaded my apartment up with weapons to protect me, or at least inform this peeping Tom that I was armed. After that night, myself, my boyfriend, and my brother were on high alert. There were a couple of times when my brother came over that he saw a sketchy guy hanging around, and even one time he saw him look at my window. He tried to follow him discreetly but the guy took off running as soon as my brother stepped in his direction. The last night I had an experience with this man, I was sitting home alone on my sofa. My boyfriend was at work at a restaurant about two blocks away. He had picked me up from work an hour earlier. We had sat on the sofa together for a little bit when we got home. Then he kissed me and left for work, locking the door behind him. After he left, I continued to sit on the couch on Reddit for a while, in silence. After about an hour of me sitting there in silence, I hear a door creak open. It's a small apartment, so to see the bedroom and bathroom doors from the couch, all I had to do was lean a little to the left. I assumed it was one of my cats coming out of my bedroom, so you can imagine my shock when I lean over and see the door that's opening is the door to the water heater closet. I look to my right and see both of my cats sleeping soundly at the other end of the couch. I look back to the door, and it's still creaking open very slowly. It opens enough for me to see it, a set of fingers wrapped around the door. Easing the door ever so gently to open it as quietly as possible. That was going to be a no-go from me, dog. I ran my ass barefooted out the door into the snow and down the street to my boyfriend's work. I called the cops. When everyone was back to check out the apartment, he was of course gone. After that, my boyfriend and I packed our shit, went to stay with my parents, and six months later, moved a thousand miles away from that town. That was the end of it. I initially found this sub around that time, as I was trying to find other stories similar to mine or people to talk to who had experienced something like I did. I had intended to write my story here eventually, and I figured after these events, I had to. I live a thousand miles away from where all of this happened, so a part of me thinks there's no way this person could have found me. But last week, I heard a knock on the front door of my apartment. I was expecting a package, so I figured it was a delivery driver and didn't answer. I'd go get the package later. Then they knocked again, and again. The third one made me feel uneasy, so I waited a good 20 minutes to check the door. When I did, 
There was no package, no note, no nothing. Someone was just knocking. Although it made me uneasy, I didn't initially think back to my stressful experience in my last town. Then, two days ago, I went out to get groceries. I have a little patio, and I go out there in the mornings to just chill or check on plants a lot, and I've been known to leave it unlocked in the day on accident. I never thought of it as a huge deal. Until I came home from the store two days ago, and the deadbolt to my apartment was locked. The deadbolt that can only be locked from the inside of my apartment, period. I assume someone robbed me because I dumbly left my patio unlocked. I called my sister, and I called my new boyfriend. I waited for people to be with me, and I went into my apartment through the sliding glass patio door. Nothing was out of place. Nothing of value was taken. At this point, my heart sank. Nothing was touched. Nothing stolen. Someone was inside of my apartment just because they wanted to be inside of my apartment. I told my boyfriend about my stalker, and he's not taking this shit lightly like my past boyfriend. I filed a police report. We checked for recording devices and cameras. He put nest cameras up all over the place, and we are on high alert. I really, truly hope this is a coincidence. But if this man really followed me across multiple state lines, there's no one on this earth I'm less interested in meeting. This started about six months ago. I was getting ready for bed in my room. It was maybe 10.30 p.m., my curtains were closed, so I couldn't see out of the window, but I heard three hard knocks on the glass. Of course that scared the living shit out of me, so I didn't even look. I ran and got my dad and made him look. Now, I live with my parents and two brothers in a fairly busy neighborhood, so noises weren't uncommon to hear. But this knock was directly on my window, so someone wanted me to hear it. The thing was, my bedroom isn't facing the front of the house or the road or anything. My room's actually towards the back of the house, so someone would have to have walked to the backyard in order to knock on my window, which seemed very odd. I had my dad check, but when he opened the curtains, no one was outside the window. He even went to the backyard to check, and no one was there. That was the first incident. I closed my curtains and brushed it off as me hearing things or some sort of animal. The following night, at almost the exact same time, I heard another three knocks on my window. I immediately went to get my dad again, only for him just to see nothing once again. But this time, I didn't brush it off, and I slept in my parents' room on the floor. The next few nights, there was nothing, until about a week later... I was home alone, and it was about 8.30 to 9 p.m., and I was on FaceTime with my friend when I heard another three knocks on my window. This time, I was home alone, so I couldn't get my dad, but I ran into their room and called them. They told me to call the neighbors to check because they were out of town, so I did. The neighbors saw nothing. The night after that, it was about 1 a.m., I think, and I heard the knocking again. It wasn't three times though, it was more. It woke me up out of a deep sleep. I was tempted to look out of the window to see who it was, but a large part of me didn't want to know. I went to get my parents again, who didn't even bother to check at this point because they didn't see anything the last few times. I kept hearing the knocking for the next few nights after that, to the point where I just ended up sleeping on the couch. My parents decided to just let me move bedrooms, and so they moved my bedroom into what was the office, and switched everything around, in the hopes that I wouldn't hear any more things. After moving bedrooms, I didn't hear anything, for about three nights. Then it started again, the same knocking, three hard times. This time I looked out of the window, I saw what I assume was a man, or a very big built woman crouching down, 
wearing a grey hoodie and some dark jeans. I closed the curtains and got my parents and told them all about it. We called the police, but they couldn't really do anything about it because we had no solid proof besides my words. They advised we get a camera facing my bedroom and around that area of the house. So that's what we did. I haven't heard the knocking since, but I do wonder who it was. Nonetheless, it makes a good story to tell. One Saturday morning, I decided to go to my local Goodwill. I'm disabled and suffer from chronic pain. I use a cane on my good days and a wheelchair on bad days. Luckily for me, this was a good day. I parked out front and got out of my car and immediately noticed a man sitting at the far corner in front of the Goodwill. As I was walking into the Goodwill, he shouted, Miss, do you have any extra time for me today? I'd never seen this man in my life and really did not want to engage with him. So I politely said, No sir, not today, I'm sorry. And I continued walking. He shouted something else at me, but I couldn't make out what he said, and I was afraid if I had stopped and asked, then he would try to engage me in a conversation. I ignored him and continued walking. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him begin to stand up. I walked faster and entered goodwill, thinking I was in the clear. I began walking along the storefront, just looking at the items. My heart dropped when I glanced through the front window and saw him walking briskly towards the entrance. I immediately thought he might be following me. This has happened to me before at Goodwills. Every time, I've wound up in uncomfortable conversations where I have to continuously decline the advances of men I'm really not interested in. It's gotten to the point where I wear a fake ring when I go out so I can say I'm married because sometimes they accept that answer better than me simply not being interested. In that moment, the disability left my body because I picked up my cane and booked it to the nearby rack of ball gowns and hid behind them. Through the gaps, I observed him storming into the store and start to look through the aisles. I was scared because he looked angry, maybe because I ignored him. I didn't mean to be rude but I thought I'd made it clear in a polite way that I did not want to speak with him. I don't think it's wrong of me to want to go thrifting without having to engage with random men. A kind woman nearby came up to the ball gowns where I was hiding and pretended to inspect them. She whispered, Are you okay? I said, I think the man in the blue is looking for me. She said she thought so as well and I asked her if any of the nearby dressing rooms were open. She pointed to the one that was, and when I saw that the man had turned his back, I dived underneath the door and locked it behind me. I called my boyfriend from the dressing room in tears and asked him to come to the store. Soon, I heard a knock at the door. The kind woman had gotten the manager. She told me that after the man looked through all the aisles, he walked out grabbed his bag and left the area. They closed the dressing room I was in and let me hide in it until my boyfriend arrived. Then, one of the male employees and my boyfriend walked me to my car. That was the end of it. Nothing really dramatic happened and since we were in public, I don't think my life was in danger, but it was an unsettling experience. I hate to think of the possible confrontation we might have had if he'd found me. I'm just so thankful to the goodwill employees and the kind woman who helped me that day. A few months ago, I was staying in my partner's apartment for a few weeks by myself. I don't quite remember why I was out that late, but it was around 1am and I just got off transit. Only one other guy got off with me, and he was rather tall and walked briskly. I was ahead of him at first, but he quickly passed me, because even though I have a quick stride, 
I'm pretty short for a guy. I don't normally live in that city, so I'm not sure why, but the streets were incredibly empty. I remember thinking that because there wasn't even a single car on the road. We were literally a five minute walk away from a major university, so it was very odd not to see a single person or car. The only lights were the street lights. I've spent nights at my partner's place before, and I never remembered it being this. Dead. Anyway, I'd walked down the street and was coming up to an intersection where I had to turn left. I noticed this guy standing around in front of the bank that was on the corner. The guy ahead of me walked by him with no problem and went straight. I was a bit wary, but I didn't think much of him until I was about maybe a meter away and he had sidestepped to be in front of me and had held his arms wide open, grinning at me. I glanced in the direction of the guy who'd left the train with me, but he was across the street already. My heart was pounding at this point, and I think I may have started to disassociate from the stress because I can't remember what he looked like, even though I remember looking directly at him. If this sounds like an overreaction, I have a history of multiple cases of CSA by different people and have PTSD among other mental illnesses I struggle with. At the time I was falling back into my disordered eating again and was also underweight in addition to being short, so definitely not the person you'd expect to win a fight, and I knew it. I remember being frozen for a moment, and then on instinct I very politely said, no thank you. I took a step to the right towards the street and tried to keep walking forward. He moved in front of me again, still with his arms wide open expecting me to hug him, still grinning. For some reason, I repeated my polite refusal and sidestepped him again instead of running the opposite direction. Luckily he let me pass, but I could hear him following me from a short distance. I was wondering what I could do in that moment. I couldn't find him. There was no one around. If I tried to call someone, he was close enough to grab me and I wasn't able to run very fast. Suddenly, I hear his steps speed up into a sprint, and before I could react, he slowed down again. I walked a bit faster. He repeated the same thing over and over. I wondered if I should go a different path so he doesn't know where I live. It wasn't the best idea since I didn't know the city very well, and he probably knew it better than I did. I decided I knew I could find help in the lobby at least, compared to if I went somewhere else. He sprinted at me again, and I turned around and loudly asked him, Do you need help? I remember not feeling my body and feeling lightheaded from the anxiety. Despite how panicked I felt, my voice came out clearly and I sounded disdainful. I don't think I meant to sound like he was annoying and inconveniencing me, but that's how it came out. Then he spoke for the first time and responded, No, do you need help? I didn't say anything to that and just turned back around and kept a fast pace towards my partner's apartment building. He was still following, but now he was talking. I can't remember much of what he said. I was just focused on getting back without being assaulted. Eventually, I heard him stop walking. I know I'm scary. I don't know why he said that. I took the opportunity to put more distance between us and kept up my pace. He didn't keep following though. He just kept saying, I know I'm scary. He got louder and louder the further I got. I got to the door of the apartment building and looked back again. He was no longer in sight. I unlocked the door to the apartment building and then ran up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. When I got into the apartment, I went straight to the window because the unit had a large window facing the street. I wanted to see if I could see him. Nothing. The streets were empty. I texted my partner about my experience, but he was already asleep and wouldn't see it. Luckily, I haven't seen that man again, and I hope I never will. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. 
I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs, just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp, but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket. Which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his and that he brought it with him and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth. Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a badger type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his and told me he wants to take me abroad as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave, but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset I've locked another friend out, I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way like he was trying to convince himself and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, 
but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door, as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check as I panicked so bad I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10 minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. I don't know if this will gain any traction, but this has been on my mind ever since it happened. I'm a respiratory therapist that works at a local hospital. I was on my way to work, about less than a mile away from my occupation, when the car in front of me quickly emerged into one of the emergency lanes as if something sudden had just happened. Then he just sat there, no hazards going off, nothing to indicate he planned on moving. I still had 20 minutes before I had to be at work. Assuming this individual may be in distress or have car problems, I decided to be a good Samaritan. I parked on the shoulder of the road and turned on my hazards. We exchanged eye contact and I gestured a wave. I rolled down my window and asked, Are you okay? He seemed to have either not heard me or ignored me, but he did seem to realize I wanted to help him. He gets out of his car at this point. Keep in mind, we are on an extremely busy road. I'm in my work scrubs, which tends to help people relax, knowing they're with a healthcare professional. However, this was different. When he got out of his vehicle, I assumed he would have told me that he was in some type of pain or something that caused him to pull over abruptly. He'd been driving fine the entire time I was behind him. So I casually get out of my vehicle and walk over to the back end of his car. This is when I officially start a conversation, asking if he's hurt. Is something wrong? All the basics. 
But the thing is, his eyes were cold. He had this body language to him that almost made him seem a little unhinged or skittish. He had not answered any of my questions, so I tried once more, asking, Hey man, we're in the middle of a busy road. Is there something wrong with your car or something going on with you? He simply replied, No. I started to feel the sensation of discomfort, like he wanted to do something to me, but was restraining himself. So I continued to play it off. He didn't seem drunk or high, but he had these black beady eyes that I could not stop looking at. It was as if he was just a vessel to something dark. I try to continue the conversation. Why did you stop, man? You don't want to get hit out here. He replies, I don't know. I don't know where to go. I didn't know what he meant by this, so I questioned further by saying, Do you know what city you're in right now? If you're lost, I can tell you where the nearest highway is, which was also less than a mile away. His reply was a little chilling. Anywhere but here. I was now confused. He didn't know where he was, but felt this urge to get out of the area as quick as possible. So I asked, Well, what direction are you wanting to go? 75N will take you to Dayton. You take 75S, you'll head to Cincinnati. He asks, What would you do in my position? Now, I have no idea what he meant by this. I simply said, I don't know what kind of position you're in, man. Can you drive? The hospital I work for is within view, and we don't have to go in. I just want to make sure you don't get hit. He agrees to follow me, but once I turned on my blinker to turn into the hospital, he completely stopped following me, pulled a U-turn, and sped off. I know this isn't the creepiest thing in the world, but you really have to try to understand just how foreign and strange this behavior was. Each time we engaged in conversation, it was as if he was contemplating to tell me something, but ultimately remained silent. From the looks of it, he drove a red Toyota, a RAV4 hybrid maybe, so I mean he didn't have a broken down car or look like he was a substance abuser. He just seemed incredibly nervous, and his fast motion gestures and twitches and his body language has left me puzzled, and it still gives me shudders when I think about how he moved and talked the lack of response, declining any help, not explaining a single reason as to why he just decided to park on the side of the road. A simple, oh, I'm just lost, would even be enough for me to feel better about the situation. He just seemed incredibly paranoid and hesitant. On top of it, the entire conversation led nowhere to his situation or why he was acting so strange. I just wanted to make sure he didn't need help or get hit by a car. Anyway, I'll update if I hear anything about a patient coming in later. He also has a face that is burned into my memory. I just got this gut feeling to leave, but be as polite as possible. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Hello friends, I've been a lurker of this subreddit for a long time, and I figured it was high time I shared some of my spooky tales. First and foremost, my name's Mickey. I'm in my 20s, and this story happened when I was still a munchkin, below the age of 12. You'll have to excuse how overly sarcastic this story may seem, it's still scary to talk about, and humor is my defense mechanism. Anyway, when I was still knee-high-ish, my grandmother, Tilly, and I used to go on yearly road trips, either across our own country or the one next to ours. We lived relatively close to the border. Well, on this particular occasion, we decided to travel across our neighboring country. We'll call my home Country A and the neighboring Country B. My grandmother had a friend in the more yeehaw part of Country B that she hadn't seen in a minute. And after some planning, they figured out the best time for the two of us to make our trip. I was excited when my grandmother first told me about the trip. I had no idea where we were going, but the idea of going on a road trip with Gram Gram was so damn exciting. I could hardly contain myself. 
Fast forward a few months, and we finally hop in the car and head off on our merry way. The trip would take approximately a week. My grandmother wanted to see all the neat stuff along the way, and traveling with a child such as myself required a lot of pit stops. I wasn't necessarily a bad traveling companion, I just had a small bladder. Anyway, we were on the last stretch of the trip when my grandmother had to pull into a gas station to fill up. We were practically running on fumes, and I really had to go to the bathroom. We pulled into this middle-of-nowhere gas station, and after my grandmother had filled up the car, we hurried inside so I could empty my bladder. The moment we walked inside, all the alarm bells in my tiny brain went off. I had no idea why I was feeling the way I was, up until I set eyes on the clerk. I'm not usually one to judge a person by how they present themselves, but old boy looked like he was straight out of a serial killer documentary. Currently, we're smack down in the center of Yeehaw territory, in the middle of nowhere, and this man looks like he should be selling you high-end cars, not working at a rundown gas station. Old boy was giving me all kinds of bad vibes. I really don't know how to explain it other than that. Worst still, he was already smiling a little too widely when he spotted my grandmother. She was petite, blonde, and beautiful. However, when he saw me, you could have sworn he was looking at a Sunday dinner. Somehow, his already very white grin only grew. Remembering it, even to this day, gives me the heebie-jeebies. Thankfully, Gram Gram could sense a disturbance in the force and shielded me from his predatory gaze. She paid for the gas and asked for the key to the washroom, which he took his sweet-ass time getting. She walked me to the bathroom, which was disgusting by the way, and I quickly did my business and we returned the key with great reluctance. Here's where things get progressively worse. When we were piling back into the car, old boy closed down the shop and got into his car. It doesn't seem too weird, right? Sure, he was really creepy but he hasn't done anything too odd yet. Now, technically, we had two days left on the trip. My grandma would drive in increments, four hours on the road, an hour off to explore, fill up, and whatever else. Then we'd find an inn or motel and spend the night. We traveled about eight hours a day before turning in for the night. Well, when we left the gas station, old boy followed us for, I shit you not, the rest of the trip. At first, we just assumed he was heading in our general direction. It was just the one road after all, but after the third turnoff and old boy was still tailing us, my grandmother finally realized we were being followed. This man proceeded to follow us for, and I wish I were joking, 12 hours. My grandmother refused to stop driving unless it was absolutely imperative. For anyone wondering why she just didn't call for help, or why she didn't pull into a police station. Don't worry, you're not the only one. To be perfectly fair to my grandmother, she didn't have a phone, and despite somewhat knowing where she was, it was still unknown territory. She wanted to get to familiar surroundings so there wasn't the risk of getting lost. We finally made it to the city where her friend resided, and that's when we pulled into a police station. The mad lad pulled up next to our car, just as we headed inside the building, and he watched us. I don't know what old boy was taking, but he sat there while my grandma talked with a lovely lady at the desk. Thankfully, the cops handled the creepy man with ease, but I'll never forget the damn smile that never left his face while he was being escorted away. Needless to say, that was the last time we road-tripped to Country B and one of the last times we actually took a road trip in general. I was about 12. My mother and I had gone to a town 45 minutes out to do some shopping with some of her friends. I had a corn snake at the time, so I asked her if I could walk around a pet store one door down from the mini supermarket that she was shopping in, so I could compare the prices of frozen mice with our local seller. She said sure, just to come back as soon as I was done. 
The pet store had been there as long as I can remember. It had a very warehouse feel about it and was poorly lit by dim fluorescent lights too far above the floor. Before checking out the mice, I just wanted to check out the rest of the store, being the curious 12-year-old I was. As I was roaming the aisles, I noticed you. You were in every aisle I strolled down. Bold, middle-aged, a bit tubby, wearing dark blue plumber's overalls over a white shirt. It was summer, and it was hot. I remember wondering why on earth you would come into a non-air-conditioned building in that. You carried a basket, but there was nothing in it. As you slowly stalked me down the aisles, I noticed your basket wasn't getting any more full. I started walking faster, taking random turns down different aisles to see if I was just being paranoid. But you were always 10 to 15 feet behind me. At some point, I finally thought I lost you. I power walked out of the pet store, and as soon as I cleared the doors, I sprinted down the street to the mini supermarket my mom was in. She hadn't even made it down the second aisle completely. I caught up to her, immediately stripped off my bright pink hoodie, and slung it in the cart, as well as ripped the hair tie out of my hair. I was smart for doing that, because when I looked back at the door, you were standing there, still carrying the basket from the pet store and scanning for any sight of a 12-year-old girl in a bright pink hoodie and ponytail. When we left, I saw you in your van as you drove away. A plain white van, like something out of a true crime documentary or horror film. I think about you sometimes, and how if you'd caught me before I got to that supermarket on that quiet Wednesday afternoon, what horrors could have been waiting for me in the back of that van. Guy in the overalls who followed me out of the pet store without even putting down his basket, even after 10 years, let's not ever meet again. When I was 16, I was in a choir at my high school that performed for a lot of different events around town. One of them was to sing at the middle school sporting events. The middle school in my hometown is just about half a mile from my childhood home, so whenever we had events there, I walked. This one night, I think in November, we had to sing at a basketball game, and it was obviously dark when I was able to leave. Normally, I wasn't allowed to walk alone at night. But for choir, I was given permission, unless I felt unsafe. But there wasn't any reason to be creeped out at first, so I started my walk. Just down from the middle school is a stretch of road with almost no street lights. It has always creeped me out when I had to walk through it. I crossed quickly and had a fast pace going, as I'm a naturally paranoid human. About two minutes into the dark zone, I heard rapid footsteps behind me. I at first figured it was a jogger, but they made no attempt to pass me and just stayed a comfortable ten-foot distance. They began whistling a jaunty tune, which at first I thought was fun. At this point, I wasn't really scared, perhaps because of the happy whistling tune, but I noticed the footsteps began to speed up. There were no cars on the road, and given the lack of light, when I turned around, all I could see was a silhouette shrouded in darkness. At that realization, I quickened my pace to barely under a run. The whistling continued, getting more breathless as this person began to run after me. I looked back to see a dark figure coming at me full speed, and in terror, I began to run frantically as well. I will never forget those last moments, running through my dark subdivision hearing his whistling and footsteps getting closer and closer. This person followed me up to my door. I ran inside and locked the front, checked all the other doors and went to my upstairs bedroom. From the window, I could still see a silhouette and could still hear him whistling. I slept with my knife that night.
It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment. I share this today as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people. Be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jez. I met Jez on OkCupid. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well and they seemed to get along. So Jez and I started dating. This guy completely sweeps me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged and validated me. Over and over again, he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe wanted and cared for. I'd never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we'd been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad, but confident that I'd done the right thing for the both of us. The next week, he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance, and reassuring me that he would rather try than not, and end up regretting it. Even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating, and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake, talking, sharing, laughing lovemaking and planning. We went places and did things that I'd always wanted to do. Then, in the deepest, most intimate moments, we would just sit there in silence. He would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment, asking, where have I been all this time? Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jez's, and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on, nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time. So, Jez offered to move in. Even though I was hesitant, we'd only been together about four months and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed. He was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy. Nothing like the person I thought I'd met and the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with my friends became a burden, if not impossible, because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience, as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I'd given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I'd already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he'd expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month he knew about it, he insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going. 
and even more stunned when we went, and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming, and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing, mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jess and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I'd gone through with my ex-husband. I am so, so happy she has you. She bleated through wine happy. You have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back. You don't fucking know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat, brewing on it for a minute, before another light-hearted interaction with Jez prompted me to suddenly snap at him through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-assed apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out the dark window at nothing in particular. In worried silence, I might have messed up, was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, that kind of thing. The man who, not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, he would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at home. I really don't care about your work. It's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jez and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most of all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he would claim. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes. Talking about them, including my now ex-husband, may have well become off-limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as an insecurity and threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket, noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I'd stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of my clothes that I'd once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there, leaving me broke almost all of the time. The horrible tragedy happened that following summer, while Jez and I were together, I received notice that a good friend I went to school with shot himself in the head while tripping on LSD. 
Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class, and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who is very familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jess, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for fucking around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response, and even more later when Jess started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking when the last time it was that I'd ever talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him for the first time after he called me at work, raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away, but once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time, and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why the fuck aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a shitty girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore into him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege, and if he's gonna wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. I didn't want him there when I got home, and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest of his stuff. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and it offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into, like Theon Greyjoy begging for his life. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42-year-old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them, I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that he cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of a heartless person I'd been spending my days with. I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jess started blowing up my phone. Apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me, and sent me walls and walls of well-thought-out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back, like a dumb, desperate girl. I took him back. It wasn't long into the second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life, and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living, so we had a good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I'd already attempted to contact Jess to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long till he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jess barreled in about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and phone number on it, reviewing what he thought was going on with my car. Before Jez butted in, cutting him off, I said she's fine, he snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye slink away at this comment, 
and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jess walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper. You don't have to answer that, but if you need anything. He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it. Seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. I thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything, it was worse, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV turn on. I have a sound bar, so the volume can get pretty loud. Jess proceeded to turn the volume up, and up, and up, far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to, even for parties. The walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jess then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter, manic with anger as though something might be funny on TV, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed, absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing, I'll watch TV if I fucking want to, and turned it up even louder. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh, wow. Poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Crying. This caused the fight to start again, and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom, where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black, and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic, and hostile message that that was a warning, and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point, and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All of our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions, but he never hit me or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground, feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panicked state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over, and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tail that I was moving out and try to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again, and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection, I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. 
So they persisted, for a while. The same act from before. The love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws, trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in. But I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on red. The illusion was destroyed. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, this definitely made me lose trust in myself. I still don't understand what the endgame was. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately, what happened to the guy I fell in love with? Chaz looked me dead in the eyes, smirked, and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that fucking asshole of a husband of yours. You were just stupid and fell for it. Jess, let's not meet ever again. So to start, I grew up in southwest Saskatchewan and moved onto my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that's on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in, though, that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent out our pasture space, and so we would have them on our property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes around the farm either. And there were tons. Every so often, when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part, as she was huge. But every so often, she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout, and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go to the bathroom. This is still a huge problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for damn near a half hour, just so she would go. On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point, she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside. But I wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated and would repeat, Go potty! every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark. I was cold and annoyed. And to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but I shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off of my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, Go! through the rain to my small, fuzzy, white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture, and suddenly in my left ear I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is, I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot, as I was mostly confused at what the fuck I just heard. I tried telling myself I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a move from a cow that I'd heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it another time. Go. 
It sounded unnatural, as if it came from someone who'd never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep, monotone go. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio, but of course there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said, and whatever it was, it started repeating it as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then, again from behind me, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds, and at this point, I remember shouting out loud, All right, don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little furball and made a mad dash for my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. My puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all, and happy mom wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what had just happened to me. She sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out, but soon after he told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he checked the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning, when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. That explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me other than that, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off of the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good, and finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you here have any idea what the hell this would have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field, as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors. And we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they're capable of mimicking words. Are there any ideas? As I was walking home from work last night, about halfway to my house, a disheveled man, who looked to be either homeless or extremely down on his luck, crossed paths with me from the other side of the sidewalk. He had initially been walking in the opposite direction, but as soon as he saw me, he immediately turned around and started following me. He began rambling incoherently and aggressively, and his words were so slurred that I hardly understood a thing he said. All I could make out was something about a care package and look at you. It was obvious this man was under the influence of multiple substances. I quickened my pace and tried to avoid eye contact with the man, and he was getting agitated that I wasn't paying attention to him. When my walking speed got too quick for his inebriated stumbling to keep up with, he stopped talking and instead began just trying to follow me. I kept looking over my shoulder at him, and every time I saw him, he would either stop or try to duck behind a bush. Finally, I started outright sprinting and looking for a spot that I could hide in myself. I came up to my local mosque and tried to sneak around the corner into the parking lot of it, where there was a little tree that I could hide behind. While hiding there, I frantically dialed 911. I told them that a strange man displaying unstable behavior was trying to follow me and described my location, myself, and the man to them. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way to where I was, but while waiting for them, I saw a figure heading up the sidewalk in front of the parking lot I was hiding in. Panic immediately filled me until the passerby was close enough 
to where I could see that it was not the same man who had just bothered me, and they turned out to be harmless. Mere moments after this, the cops arrived to where I was. They pulled up next to the tree and motioned for me to come out and talk to them. The officer driving the vehicle asked me the standard questions, a description of the incident, where I was when it happened, the usual. While we were talking, he spotted a man in another parking lot down the street, not far from where I had first encountered the creep. He asked me if this was the man I'd encountered, and it was hard to tell between the darkness and the distance, but I was pretty sure it was. Another police vehicle had pulled into that parking lot, and it appeared that an officer got out to talk to the man. The officer I had been talking to asked me how far I was from my house, and I told him I was pretty close to my street at this point. He assured me that I should be safe to walk the rest of the way home, and that they had other cops patrolling the area. I thanked him and finished walking home, without further incident, thank God. Shortly after I got home, I saw that I had a text from my boyfriend that read, Are you okay? The text had been sent at around the time the incident was occurring, as if he could sense I was in a fearful situation. I replied back, telling him what had happened. He told me that he'd gotten yelled at by a homeless man earlier too. I described the creep I'd encountered to him and asked if he thought it was the same guy. He said he didn't think so. We also had a brief phone call to make sure each other was okay. I let him know that I was home safe, and he told me he was in a vehicle with a group, so he was safe too. I don't know what the cops ended up doing about the man, but I hope he stays as far away from me as possible. I live in a city located in a valley with a lot of smaller towns of the hills and mountains around, so it's part of the local culture for teenagers and young adults to visit these smaller areas during the winter to drink, smoke weed, and hang out with their friends. My uncle bought a house in one of these areas, so eventually I decided to get the keys and spend a weekend there with five of my friends. The house has two big bedrooms with three beds each and a lot of extra mattresses. At night, we decided at some point to go back inside and just chill watching TV. But since the living room had no sofas yet, we brought some mattresses from the bedrooms and just used them. One of my friends, Victor, decided to go out to smoke, and after some minutes, we hear some knocking at the window just behind us. Everyone got scared for a second, but just looked at the window and said things like, Oh shit, it's just Victor. But since we were sitting on mattresses close to the ground, it wasn't easy to see clearly who was at the window. And since the person just stood there looking straight at one of the girls, I got up to check. I saw a man who somehow looked a lot like my friend, but a bit more fat and older than him. As I came to the conclusion that it was a stranger, I froze while looking at him and him looking back at me. When I said, it's not Victor. Everyone else also froze and looked at me waiting for a reaction. But all I could think was to ask what he wanted. He just stood there for a second and asked, There's a bar nearby, and we need a drummer to play with our band. Are any of your friends a drummer by any chance? Which weirdly enough I am, but I just told him no, and after some extra long seconds looking at us, he left. My friend came back, and we made fun of the situation, making jokes on how it was him messing with us and whatnot. Later, most of the group decided to sleep in one bedroom and leave the second for me and one of the girls since they saw us kissing earlier. We all go to bed, but some hours later, I wake up to the girl shaking me in horror and whispering that she heard something coming from the kitchen. So I get up, tell her to lock the bedroom when I leave, and go check the sound like the moron who always dies first in films. As I pass by the second bedroom, I think about calling someone else to join me, but as soon as I see them all sleeping, I hear something at the kitchen's window. I quickly move there in silence, 
check around, and as soon as I find and grab a knife, the door opens right in front of me. It was the same guy. I knew it was no joke since I just saw my friend sleeping. It probably took like five to ten seconds of us staring at each other, but it felt like an eternity. While still holding the door handle, he made a slow movement with the other hand towards something under his shirt, which was probably a firearm or a knife, but I also lifted my hand, showing him the knife, so he stopped. The kitchen was quite small, so we were standing pretty close to each other, and at this point, we both knew it would end bad for both of us if he tried something, so I shook my head and said as calm as I could, don't. He continued to stare at me for a little bit longer, and then finally closed the door and went away. I went back, told the girl it was nothing, and that we should go back to bed. I didn't sleep that night. We left early in the morning, and I made sure to ask my uncle and cousins if they ever received weird visits there. They said that the only person who ever goes there at night is the old neighbor when his wife doesn't let him arrive drunk at home. So he grabs my uncle's rocking chair to sleep until he gets sober. Now, every year, my friends talk about spending another weekend there, but I always make an excuse so we never go through that again. And they don't know what happened that night. This happened seven and a half years ago, June 23rd, 2016, while I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start clearing out and moving my stuff to the next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I'd moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up, and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sort of by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a bit different to me. In order to get in, I had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it, and I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work, I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside. Then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone, told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that 
this random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like a vivid nightmare I needed to wake up from. I still remember this date, seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar. A scar I don't know if I will ever heal from. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, it never gave me a problem. Denoise, denoise, denoise. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return, and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door, and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, 
and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. I'm a 17-year-old female working as a cashier at a popular thrift store. I've been there for approximately 8 months, and I love my job and my co-workers. The common thing I've noticed is that unfortunately, any time a new younger female cashier starts working, she will be hit on by plenty of older guys, and I was no exception to that. I've never had to deal with creepy or weird customers until this job, and I worked in the food industry before, so maybe that's why. We of course get a handful of regulars. And while I've had a few creepy older guys hit on me before, there's a regular that comes in all the time. I want to say he's in his late 40s, and while he's always nice, my manager pointed out his obsession with me. I was called in the office the other day so he could show me how he acts and such with surveillance cameras. Here's a list of what's been pointed out to me that I didn't really notice before. He comes in at roughly the same time I'm working every day and apparently doesn't show up on my days off. I work closing most of the time, so he comes in around 6pm. When he comes in, he will immediately look at the register I almost always work at and will do a double take looking for me. He usually buys one bullshit item, spending about 15 minutes in the store usually. My manager has pointed out that he needs to buy something or else he knows it'll look weird. Every time, without fail, he will go to my register, and even when I was on the floor doing recovery, he'll ask me to check him out because I'm his favorite cashier. If there's a shorter line, it doesn't matter. He will stay at my register waiting and watching me. He lingers around after buying something just to talk to me, showing me things on his phone, making sure there's no one else in line. My manager said he approaches me when I'm alone so he can talk to me without holding up a line. He's commented on my hickeys that I failed to cover up before on my neck, making weird remarks here and there. He says he usually checks because there's always about one or two. He said I would look good as a blonde, which isn't inherently weird, but paired with everything else, I guess it is. When I wasn't wearing any makeup, he would say something like, you seem out of sorts recently. I started wearing makeup again recently, and he's commented saying he likes that I'm back to my old self. I've noticed weird flirty remarks with him, but I always brush it off, because customers are always kind of weird, and I deal with that often anyway. He'll lean over the register counter to talk to me closer, just his body language in general. He does a double take when he leaves too, keeping his eyes on me. I think it's possible he knows what car I drive. He was at my work this morning, even though I always do closes. I've asked my boyfriend, who works with me, if it's true that he never shows up when I'm off. He said yes, it's true. I don't think he knows my schedule, but he might know my car and see it in the parking lot. He always parks out of the store outdoor camera view, so I still don't know what car he drives. The general manager was made aware by the manager, but the creep didn't interact with me much today because I was never alone at the register 
or on the floor. I was training a new cashier today. He was there a lot longer than usual, I'm assuming because he was waiting for a time when I was alone and there were no customers. I think he gave up when he realized I would be training for the majority of my shift and seeing how busy it was. Since I worked opening yesterday, he came in before my shift at work, probably assuming I would be opening again. I'm working closing tonight. Apparently, he came in earlier and saw the new cashier, so we actually ended up asking one of them. New cashier? Who quit? Probably thinking I quit. It's only 4.33. He usually comes in around 6 if I'm closing. I'm just waiting to see if he shows up for the second time today. I doubt he will since he might think I don't work today. My manager and I are going to keep a log of what time he comes in and leaves. I'm going to keep his phone number saved in my notes so I can look him up and hopefully find his name and other information. I will possibly keep my phone on the counter to voice record what he says. I wish I could record him in person, but it would be too obvious. If I get shown more security footage, I will video that and stare. Last night, my boyfriend and I got in bed. Lights off, TV on, in bed naked as usual. A couple of minutes go by of us talking and our cat jumps on the nightstand and is staring outside. He does this all the time, so I assume it's a stray cat out there. He runs across the bed to my nightstand, so I peek outside. My cat's tail is all fluffy, so I think it's just the cat that he doesn't like. I look out the window and see a phone screen. I have no clue what was on it. I didn't think to actually look that hard. It was a red thing in the middle, but that's all I know. I look at my boyfriend. Assuming I'm just seeing the reflection of his phone, when I see my boyfriend is not holding his phone, I back myself into the corner of the wall so whatever's in the window can't see me. I just repeatedly say, there's someone outside, until my boyfriend finally gets up. I grab a sweater and pants from the floor, and we're just walking around the house as he calls 911. We come back to the room, and the guy is still out there but my cat will not let me get near the window without growling, so I don't get to see his face. The cops get there a few minutes later and search the block. They come from the front yard and the backyard, climb some fences, and they don't find anyone. They just say they'll be on the lookout and to stay aware pretty much. My boyfriend and I are both reasonably shaken up. I point out the cat was acting similarly last night. Not exactly, but she was fluffed up and on edge. He pointed out that with how often I sleep naked or close to, it's possible the guy has done that multiple times to see. He also points out that with the lights on, you could definitely see into the bedroom from that window, so he would have been able to see us having sex if he caught us on the right night. There's no proof he's been there more than once, and with our neighborhood, he was probably just some guy on drugs wandering around. He left the gate open, stood there even though we clearly spotted him, and just didn't seem too smooth in his operation. I don't know. I just hope it was a one-time thing. I feel so helpless. I didn't go outside and do anything because I didn't know if he had a weapon, but I wish I could have. My boyfriend wants to buy a gun this weekend, and I hope that can at least give me some sense of security. I was relocating across Texas and, as I normally do, was driving through the night to skip traffic. And because it's more serene that way, I was driving straight through central Texas going northwest so seeing the hill country change to desert by the light of the full moon was really cool. Anyways, I was driving with my now ex-wife. It was around 2am and we were running low on gas. 
Luckily, we were pulling into a tiny no-name town, and we could see an old gas station come around the bend. Now, this town only has one road, and this station was right at the edge of town, at the very end of the road. When I describe the gas station as old, I mean very old. The type that has no prepaying option, you simply flip up the handle on the machine, and you hear the pump inside start struggling to get the gas from the reservoir. It had the old style tick readers too, not a thing electrical on it. I, being a young man, had never seen one before, so I walked into the store to buy the gas before I pumped. There was only one light on in the store, at the far back, and I almost thought it was closed since it was barely brighter inside than it was outside in the moonlight. Upon entering, I saw the place was deserted. No customers, no workers, nothing. However, there was an odd tune playing on someone's radio that I couldn't place. An old-sounding upbeat piano piece was playing somewhere around the corner, inside, and I heard shuffling once I walked closer to the source. This place made me feel scared, not just a, whoa, this is creepy, scared, but a, all hairs are on end, something is seriously wrong here, but I can't figure it out, scared. As I turned the corner, I saw a young man standing next to a large radio and dancing. His dancing, though, was extremely off-putting and seriously didn't match the tune at all. Though the radio was cranking out what sounded like ragtime, this guy was running his hands up and down his body and pretty much feeling himself with his eyes closed in what looked like bliss. He was going far slower than the music and definitely wasn't on tempo. For some reason, I couldn't speak. I couldn't even move. I was in a trance as every part of me screamed to turn and leave. Eventually, though, I said, Excuse me, I just need to get some gas. The guy kept dancing. I said it a bit louder, and he finally slowed down a bit and opened his eyes and focused them on me. But it was like he was looking at a finely cooked steak. He was looking almost through me and silently walked to the register without saying anything. I said, Uh, just twenty dollars, please. He, again, didn't say anything and just stood behind the ancient register, so I just figured maybe he didn't speak the language or was embarrassed I caught him dancing, so I laid the money on the counter and went outside, hoping he'd turn on the pump. I filled up, told my wife about the weird-ass scene in there, and, when I was done, turned off the pump to kill the horrible grinding noise from the interior pump fighting against gravity to get the gas up. The weird thing is, when we were leaving, I looked back in the window and the guy was still standing there behind the counter. Not all that unusual in itself, but I could see my money was still on the counter in front of him. It was like a robot who just turned off once I left. This is where it gets really weird. A couple of months later, I was driving back to San Antonio to visit family and we figured we'd stop at that old gas station to see it in the daytime, since it had become somewhat of a running joke between us. We pulled into this tiny town, and the thing was gone. The lot it sat on at the end of the road wasn't even there. It was just grass, no rubble, no old pump, no lighting, nothing. It was like somebody picked it up and moved it. It looked like nothing had been there for years. I still get freaked out thinking about it. This happened to me a few years ago while traveling. I was private tutoring and my boss sent me to his office to pick up my paycheck at the end of the first month. He gave me the address, so me and my boyfriend at the time drove there and he waited outside for me. It was a tall building and I approached what looked like a security guard. I showed him the address I had written down to make sure it was the right place. He studied it 
nodded, and told me it was on the fifth floor, and he showed me the direction to the elevator. As I got in the elevator, he stepped in with me. He pressed number five. I assumed it was his job to escort people to the right floors. He was staring me up and down the entire time. I glanced down at the address my boss had written down and realized it said, Second floor, not fifth. I turned to the security guard and I started to say, I think we're a little confused as this says second. He made out he didn't understand my language, so I started to repeat the number two in Vietnamese instead. He completely ignored me and instead turned and gave me this creepy smile. It still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. He reached out and started to stroke my hair, saying, So beautiful. I froze to the spot and started to shout, No, Adam, over and over. By this point, the doors to the elevator had opened. I stepped out and looked around, and there was absolutely nothing there. It was under construction. There was paint and dirty old sheets everywhere, all over the floor. I ran towards the window and looked outside to see if I could get my boyfriend's attention, but I was too high up. The creepy guy had gotten out too and was pointing me down an empty corridor. He looked really frustrated now. He was blocking the elevator by this point, so I couldn't get back in. I pretended to walk towards the corridor and he followed me. When I got to the door, I bolted back to the elevator and started to press the button to the ground floor, and he followed me. Whenever the doors closed, he would just press the button from the other side, and they'd open again. He was shouting at me in Vietnamese and looked angry with me. The adrenaline had kicked in, and I was literally thinking about anything I could use or how I could defend myself if he tried anything with me. I started screaming as loud as I possibly could to make him back off. As I pressed the ground floor button and the doors began to close again, he smiled at me once more. This awful, creepy smile that I think about all the time. My heart was in my mouth as I imagined what would be waiting for me when the doors inevitably opened again. To my surprise, the elevator started moving towards the ground floor this time, and I managed to get out. I ran out as fast as possible and was crying by the time I got to my boyfriend. He wanted to go back inside, but I stopped him and made him drive me home. Fast. The same day, I called my boss and explained what had happened. It turns out that I wasn't even in the right building, never mind the right floor. I blame myself for getting the wrong address, but a different country in that. I don't know why the guy in there pretended I was in the right location, or what his intentions were with me, or even why he decided to just let me go. Maybe he was trying to scare me, or maybe he was trying his luck with me. I have no idea, but I think about it from time to time, or tell the story again to someone and it really creeps me out to think of what could have been. I've never gotten in an elevator with a man again, either. To preface this, I love to drive, like hours long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind, just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventual cities, and I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four to five years ago and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female 
and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort out personal issues. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household, when I used to live with my parents as a mean of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues that I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend. I couldn't focus on anything else. I decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and not to be gone for too long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life. So I decided to drive further north, down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend, and I was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere the few houses miles back from the road lightless and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights and even then I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now, it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of a sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutted out onto the road, kind of like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do it. The driver's side door was flung open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it toward the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. The cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it but there was still a part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out, Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. 
I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I figured out my next course of action then. So, again I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadow of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan, and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person did not have any blood on them or appeared injured in any way, they were wearing a mask, not like the face mask for the pandemic or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was. I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat out of hell my heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off, so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me. Though I had no clue what they were saying, I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow and chase me, or if they'd stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road, watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks, and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, and stuff like that, he told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police and sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for the police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through the hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even 10 or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, really freaked out for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with them until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement, and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it. Though, with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark-colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here, and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had.
I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car? Or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I'd stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere. And I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. This happened to me three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I just moved into a new apartment one month ago, and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I've been using my parents' address as my mailing address all of my life. Three nights ago, my parents call me at 2am freaked out and proceed to tell me this story. Apparently, at 1am, someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs and opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. There was a man standing outside, who looked to be in his thirties, with a black hoodie on with a hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair, or tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic. Neither my stepdad or my mother recognized the man. The man says, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for Alice Fitzgerald. My stepdad plays dumb and says, Who? The man proceeded to state my full name again and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend and tells my stepdad that they are both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at home. I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself with my three dogs and haven't been in a relationship in the past five to six months. Here's the weird part. My stepdad asked the guy what boyfriend he was talking about, and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend I had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in 10th grade has a very unique Italian name. I've never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him and repeats that they are very worried about me and if my stepdad is sure I'm not inside. At this point my stepdad is weirded out and closes and locks the door in his face. The man does not leave. He lingers in front of my parents' house for the next ten minutes, smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About five minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end on their block and drives away in a silver car. My stepdad was unable to get the license plate. My parents file a police report and nothing else happens. After I hear this story, I'm going nuts over the weirdest details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago? And what would the motive be of making up a story that included the weird detail about my past? I have not had contact with a 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade. Yesterday, I decided to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story. He's just as confused as I am and claims to have no part in it. I'm at a loss. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1am to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated. No, nothing else weird has happened since then. I also want to add something here. First off, I'm not in any legal trouble and have no reason to think someone would be suing me. I mean, I guess it's in the realm of possibility that I am being sued by someone, but I really don't think that's it. I had an expired registration ticket that I did not show up to court for, but I believe I got a letter in the mail just asking me to pay a really large fee, so I don't think that's related. I did take out a personal loan. I took it out about a year and a half ago. It wasn't for anything too crazy, and I was really good with making payments on it until about six months ago, when I had a medical issue. Currently, I'm really behind on payments. But to my knowledge, I've not defaulted on the loan yet. I called the loan company 
and they claimed to have nothing to do with it. All of my family and friends also noted that the 1am factor kind of rules that out anyway. Nothing else strange has happened at my parents. I went there for the first time last night and kept a close eye out for anything. I didn't observe anything out of the norm, so this remains a mystery. I'll be sure to update if something else happens. I wanted to see if I could see him. Nothing. The streets were empty. I texted my partner about my experience, but he was already asleep. For context, I typically go shopping at around 7 or 8 p.m. nowadays, since the store is less crowded around then. However, I try not to go unless I have to, because number one, the pandemic, and number two, being shut out after sundown doesn't feel comfortable for my safety. Despite this, the area I live and shop in is what I would consider to be safe. So going for a quick grocery run a little later in the evening has felt okay lately. So about two weeks ago, I was at my usual grocery store at around 7pm. I read somewhere online that you should make your trips to the store 30 minutes or less, and being the Gemini that I am, I knew I would have to make a list on my phone to follow, or I would dawdle. I began my trip in the produce section, essentially only looking up from my phone to step out of people's way or to grab whatever was on my list. There were more people in the store than there usually were in the evenings when I go, so I had to make a few laps to wait for folks to clear certain areas that I needed to get to. I first realized I needed to do this when I was at the carrot section, but since it was too crowded, I figured I'd circle back in a minute or two and grab something on the other side of the section in the meantime. Trying to determine where to go, I looked up from my phone and began walking towards the bananas. On my way to get to them, I just kind of looked forward blankly, not really thinking of anything besides my task at hand. This was short-lived, because a man in a grey zip-up hoodie and a baseball hat caught my eye as we walked past one another. Nothing really stood out about him besides the fact that he was looking at me, and that he was walking really fast. I didn't think anything of it and kept forth towards the bananas. As I gathered my produce and a few things along the way back to the carrots, I passed the same man again. He made eye contact with me again. Normally, I'm not one to really make eye contact with other patrons. I'm a mind-my-own-business kind of person but his demeanor just caught my eye. I also noticed that he was the only person in the section not carrying anything. It had to have been at least three minutes since we first passed one another, so to think that he was just kind of perusing around and not getting anything was strange. It's not like he just got there either. As I finally get the carrots, I make my way over to the bakery section, and the man passed me once again. This time, I didn't make eye contact, but I turned around to see where he was going. This sounds silly, but the way he was moving around the store didn't make sense. I was working my way from the front to back, and he was walking erratically in all different directions. Might I remind you, he still had nothing with him. As I begin to turn my head to see what this man is doing, Another guy runs past me, wearing all black. Okay, strange, but he ran so close to me that the hair that was in front of my left shoulder was blown behind my back from the gust of air he blew past me. Since I was already turning my head, I fixate to see where this man is going. He had run over to the man that was passing by me frequently, and they were both looking right at me and talking to one another. They were about 30 feet away from me, so I couldn't make out what they were saying. I also looked for maybe a second because it was at this point that I started to get pretty anxious. I'd like to mention that I have generalized anxiety disorder, so when I'm in suspicious situations that might flare up anxiety, I really try to talk myself down from anything that might be illogical. I mean, who would follow me in a grocery store? I wasn't sure what to make of what I was seeing. In an attempt to soothe my anxious thoughts, I decided to continue shopping and tried not to fixate on the two men. I looked back down at my phone 
and realized I forgot to grab lemons from the produce section, so I was irritated that I had to go back. I began walking, head down, when a woman taps my shoulder. I'm already feeling a myriad of emotions at this point, and to be touched by a stranger during a pandemic, I was really annoyed. I looked back up behind me to see who could have possibly been clumsy enough to knock into a stranger when my eyes locked with the woman's who bumped me. Now, this is kind of difficult to explain, but stay with me. It's a pretty popular thing among women to communicate solely through eye contact and body language. Now, I know that all people, of all genders, do this, but for women specifically, it's different. I've been out with friends that have told me, save me from this creep, without saying a single word. So despite the masks and distance between us, something in me told me to listen to her. She rolled her eyes downwards towards the floor, as if a ball were rolling past her feet, in the exact direction of the men that were looking at me and lapping me. She didn't look directly at them, but I knew she was indicating she was about to say something about them. She looked back up at me, and in a whisper told me, Heads up. My stomach sank. I knew I wasn't just paranoid. Someone else had noticed that something weird was going on. I walked past her to her right and said, Uh-huh, to indicate that I understood what she meant. It was at this point that I needed to get out of the store without looking panicked or raising suspicions. When I told my boyfriend this story, he questioned why I didn't just leave right then and there. First off, I had a basket full of produce that I needed to pay for. Second, I didn't want to raise suspicions or alert these men as to why someone they're following is suddenly making a run for it. So I swiftly began to navigate the aisles as to gather a few more things on my list. As I moved through the store and looked down the aisles to see what items were where, one of the men were in each aisle, walking towards me. Every aisle I went down, one of them was there. I was fucking terrified. I decided it was time to go. I went to self-checkout and hauled ass. I did my best to appear calm but I know I looked frantic. Since it was dark outside, I did not feel comfortable walking to the car by myself. Once I was done, I approached three employees chatting amongst one another. I luckily got the attention of a female store manager and thought on my feet. I told her that my ex-boyfriend was in the store following me and I needed to be walked out. In hindsight, I probably should have alerted them to what was actually going on, but I wanted to get out of there, no questions asked. And she didn't ask questions. She said, Oh shit, okay, I'm getting security to walk you out to your car. And as the guard appeared from the back of the line waiting to use the self-checkout, so did the two men. They made eye contact and broke left and right. When I tell you I almost pissed myself, my god, my heart was in my throat. Luckily, I didn't see the men outside. The last I saw them was by the self-checkout. The security guard so kindly walked me to my car and made sure I drove away, which I am so grateful for. I called my boyfriend, sobbing since my anxiety was so high at this point, and he advised me to take a different route home and make four right turns if I thought anyone was following me. For precaution, I stayed at a friend's house that night because I was so anxious. I'm so grateful nothing happened to me and that I'm here, but I cannot thank the woman who warned me in the store enough for validating my suspicions. If you witness anything that looks sketchy or weird, please tell or warn someone. I haven't heard about any kidnappings or crimes towards women in my area recently, thank god. It just scares me to think what could have possibly happened, and what kind of people are out there. I think it goes without saying that I'm no longer going shopping after sundown, nor at that store. I'm blanking on where I heard this, 
but I think it really applies to how I felt that night. It's better to be safe than sorry, and to be paranoid than dead. This isn't a ghost story, but something which happened a long time ago when I was at university. My friend, A, was a regular pitcher in the university's baseball team. He was a well-built guy and he was tall as well. We had a test coming up and he was in the library cramming. I was also there and I saw everything unfold. I had the perfect view. The library was nice and quiet and before I knew it, it was already dark out. There was still plenty of time before the library closed, though. You know those nights in late September, where the night draws in quicker and it's rainy out? It was one of those. I saw A down there. He was putting his things in his rucksack and getting ready to leave. It was really raining heavily out there. I knew that it would be raining because I checked the weather forecast. A probably didn't check the weather forecast, as he didn't bring an umbrella. There were a few left by the entrance of the library. I guess he thought he could just take one since no one was using it, or perhaps someone forgot it there. He was that kind of guy, always taking what wasn't his. He would often ask to borrow things, never having the presence of mind to think ahead. He searched through the umbrellas, ignored the cheap-looking vinyl ones, and went for the biggest one he could find. He said later that he noticed something sticky on the handle. He thought it might have been a prank or something. I was stood up because I thought he was about to steal my umbrella, so I was keeping an eye on him. That's how I saw everything. I watched him open the large umbrella he selected, then a huge boom resounded around the library, emanating from the entrance followed by the sound of A screaming. Members of staff came rushing over to him. The whole library stunk of a smell not too dissimilar to fireworks. A was engulfed in smoke, and his right arm was alive with fire. The staff helped to quickly extinguish the flames, and A left in an ambulance. He suffered horrendous burns to his hand. The police and the fire department came to investigate what happened in the library. The umbrella was packed full of a gunpowder-like substance they said was found in fireworks. The outside of the handle was coated in some kind of flammable gel, the sort you might find in a camping store or something. The one-touch button part of the umbrella was equipped with a kind of ignition device, and when that button was pressed as the umbrella opened, it ignited the fire. What made things worse was the fact that A was wearing a coat made from a synthetic material. The heat of the fire melted his coat to his arm. The day that this happened was a particularly busy day in the library, as a lot of students were preparing for various tests. There were so many people coming and going, it was impossible for the police to figure out who the criminal was. There were also no fingerprints on the umbrella, and since the crime seemed to be targeted at no one in particular, it meant that identifying any suspect was impossible. Sadly, A didn't end up pursuing a career in baseball. He went in a different direction due to the nature of his injuries. What a shame. It really makes you think about taking things which aren't yours, doesn't it? This happened one night a few years back. I was a student at the time. I was working at a convenience store trying to save some cash for university. I was living with my parents. I walked a couple miles back home from my part-time job at the convenience store. I would usually get picked up, but my parents were out on a date. The fog was thick that night, and there was no one on the streets. It was a perfect autumn night. I was wrong, though. I noticed after about 10 minutes that someone was walking behind me. I didn't pay it much mind, but when this person was taking every turn I was taking on my route home, I grew concerned. I looked over my shoulder while crossing the road to see that the owner of the footsteps behind me was a man. 
I turned onto my street and up to my house, grateful to hear him turn off in a different direction. It was quite foggy that night. The street lights were lit early, and since I worked a long shift, I went over to the mailbox before going inside. I was expecting something. At that point in my life, I hadn't really had any paranormal experiences or been in the line of any inherent danger. That all changed that night, though. While I was checking my mailbox, something appeared from the corner of my eye that made me turn to the right to face it. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then I quickly realized that there was a figure at the other end of the street. I was fairly certain it was the man. Not the guy from before, I prayed. It was strange because he was just standing there, completely still, and I guessed that he was staring straight at me. My fight-or-flight reflex kicked in, and I quickly made my way to my front door. The hairs on my neck were standing on end. I inherently knew that there was something off about this situation, and I needed to get out of it. I unlocked the door, turned to have a last look, and nearly fainted. The figure was now at the end of the driveway. I needed to get inside and get behind a locked door. Once inside, I looked through the window, and he was gone. I was trembling in fear. I couldn't see where this guy was, and I couldn't decide whether or not to turn the lights on, but I continued to periodically check the window. I almost jumped out of my skin when the neighbor's dog started barking loudly. I was really frightened. My blood froze in my veins as I heard footsteps. Hearing the footsteps approaching my front door, I ran, covering my mouth to prevent myself from screaming, and I looked through the peephole. The outdoor sensor light wasn't on, but I could see the wall well enough due to the street lights, and it was light out due to the fog. Barely breathing, I stared through the peephole and gasped in fear when a dark shadow appeared. I was sure that it was the man with his hood pulled over his head, and he was inches from the door. Instinctively, I flipped the light switch and went back to looking through the peephole. He wasn't there. I raced around the house and turned every light on while trying to find my phone. I was in such a panic, I had no idea where I'd put my handbag. I was shaking in terror as I crept into the kitchen and grabbed a knife from the knife block. The dog had stopped barking, and for a moment, I thought that the man had gone to silence them. I was too frightened to look out of the window. Then, I heard my neighbor's voice yelling. I was saved. I won't repeat the language he used but he made sure that the creep was off of our property. He came over, and when I was certain that the man was gone, I opened the door. We spoke for a little while, and he calmed me down. I even asked him to check all the rooms in the house. I was a bit embarrassed, but I cannot tell you how shook up I was. It seemed like hours had passed before my parents got home. I explained it all to them, and they told me I needed to make a statement to the police in the morning. After one more check on all the windows, I went to bed. Early the next morning, at around 2 a.m., something woke me up, and I sat bolt upright, straining my ears. The silence was so deafening, but my beating heart almost hurt with the slowly building anxiety. I felt for sure that the man was back. I checked the windows. Nothing. I stayed up until dawn. I never saw him again, and I really don't want to either. The whole experience terrified me. I always make sure doors are locked, no matter where I go. Ever since then, I've been afraid of fog too. This is a scary experience I had with my brother. On the night that this took place, my brother and I decided to go watch a movie in the cinema. The only issue was that the movie wasn't screening in our town, and we would have to drive kind of far. We didn't really care though, as we were young. I think I was about 16, and my brother was 19. 
So when you're at that age, you feel like you have all the time in the world. It was just over an hour's drive, and the only showing was at night. We got there on time and watched our movie, and then had some dinner in a fast food place. We hit the road at about 11pm and started making our way home. It had been a great night. My brother was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We were using the satellite navigation system since we were driving along unfamiliar roads. Although it was kind of a long drive and late, we had plenty to talk about. We were talking about the movie and food for some reason. Just for some context, we were driving back to our hometown in Kagawa from Tokushima. This is in Shikoku. The navigation system leads us in a different direction to the way we came. It seemed to be taking us away from the highways. I felt like this was to avoid either an accident on the road or some late night reworks. It wasn't great though because we were on National Route 11 and that ran alongside the sea. It was incredibly well lit and the roads were wide. Now we were going through winding narrow mountain passes. We ended up getting a little lost. Since my brother and I didn't know these roads, we couldn't really figure out where to go. I mean the satnav wasn't exactly helping us, but as we were young, we felt as if the satnav knew better, so we made a choice to keep following its directions, and that turned out to be a very bad choice. We headed further into the darkness of the mountain and away from the bright lights of the highway. We would try to reassure one another that we were probably being sent to a shortcut and everything would be fine. We relied on the satnav's directions. The last of the streetlights disappeared. There was nothing but darkness ahead of us and all around. I got worried, so I said to my brother, This is a little odd, huh? The satnav says it's fine, my brother replied. He couldn't hide his look of concern from me. I could see it written on his face. Dark thickets of trees towered either side of the road as our car chugged up higher into the mountains. Because we were now on uneven roads, the car was making some strange noises which began to panic me. It sounded like the engine was struggling. I swallowed my pride and said to my brother, Hey bro, I gotta be honest, I'm getting scared now. Why don't we make a U-turn and just get back on the highway? My brother didn't respond. He was just fixated on the road ahead. I felt my heart begin to canter now. I asked him the same question again. He didn't say a word. I watched as he tightened his grip on the steering wheel. Hey bro, come on, you're scaring me now. Just as I was about to ask him to make a U-turn for the third time, he drew in a deep breath and finally spoke. Don't look behind. Something strange is going on. I felt my spine turn to ice. I didn't even really understand what he meant. Why was he being so vague? I instinctively wanted to look behind me, but I did as he asked. I sat there in silent contemplation, unable to muster the courage to say another word. For a little while, I thought that my brother might be teasing me. We did like to prank one another, but neither of us had ever gone as far as this. This seemed way too serious. I looked over at him to see if he had a sly smirk on his face, but he looked like he was in the zone, incredibly focused and yet incredibly concerned. When I saw that look of determination on his face, I knew there was something behind us. I noticed that we were speeding up as well now, then my brother floored it. I felt myself slam backwards in the passenger seat. It was terrifying. At any moment, another vehicle coming in the opposite direction could appear behind one of the bends in the mountain road. We were going way too fast. Whatever was behind us had forced my brother to drive incredibly recklessly. I went against my brother's orders and I looked in the wing mirror to try and see what was behind us, but I couldn't see anything. Had my brother just gone completely mad? I was silent. I wanted to plead with him to slow down, but I didn't want to divert his attention from driving. Despite being on these dark, intricate roads, he drove even faster. I felt for sure that we were going to collide with something at any moment so I kind of braced myself. I tensed up, 
then, suddenly, we were turning. We skidded into a hard left, and at that moment, I shut my eyes and braced for impact. A second or two went by, and I slowly opened my eyes and looked over at my brother. His face had lost all of its color, and his knuckles were white. It was as if he was hanging onto that steering wheel for dear life. I couldn't make a sound. I just prayed that we would get back on some streets with lights and away from whatever had scared my brother into driving like this. I shut my eyes again, thinking back to that night now. Trying to remember how I felt really makes me feel for my brother. I mean, if I was feeling that scared, I bet he was feeling it more since he was the one driving. After a few moments, my brother said, It's okay now. He's not following me anymore. I think we're good now. I opened my eyes to see streetlights in the distance. It was as if my prayers had been answered. We turned onto the National Highway route, and I saw the sea. I knew that when I saw that, we were going to be fine. I cannot tell you how relieved I was at that point. Once relief settled in, a new feeling emerged. Curiosity. I needed to know what caused my brother to drive like our lives depended on it. I needed to know what had been following us. Bro, what was behind us? Something really freaked you out, didn't it? I asked him. My brother drew in another deep breath like before and said something like this. Pretty much as soon as we made that turn off onto the mountain roads, I felt as if we were being tailed. I knew because at one point the rear sensor went off. I didn't see anything behind it first because of the dark, and that was when I realized that we were being tailed by a car without its headlights on. I thought that whoever was driving must know these mountain roads well if they were confident enough to drive with no lights. At first he was glad to see that other cars were using these roads because he thought that the sat-nav might be right. He said he felt uncomfortable that the car had its lights off. He wanted to pull over to let it pass as it was speeding up behind him now and then. However, the roads were way too narrow to allow him to pull off to the side to let the car behind pass. It was at that point he glanced in the rearview mirror to try to get a better look at the driver. He said the sight of the driver took his breath away. The driver had the interior light of his car on, and my brother could see his face. He was smiling. He said it wasn't a happy smile, but a disgusted grin that came with furrowed brows. That was the moment that my brother said he knew we had to get away from that car and its driver. That was the moment he started driving faster. It made sense to me now why when I looked in the wing mirror, I couldn't see anything. When my brother made that screeching left turn, the car behind apparently carried on going straight. We weren't sure if the driver tried to turn around to follow us, but we don't think that he did because my brother didn't see him again that night. We managed to arrive home safely without further incident. That experience really had an effect on my brother. He became a lot more anxious and jumpy after that. He sought out some help though, and thankfully I don't think it has permanently scarred him or anything. My brother and I are fine these days, doing well, no injuries. That was one scary night though. I torture myself every now and then when I think about what that grinning driver's intentions were. I feel as if he was trying to shepherd us someplace since he appeared to know the mountains well enough to drive in the dark. He wasn't scared of showing us his face, and that is pretty unnerving. It makes me feel as if something more than a robbery might have been on the cards. Your guess is as good as mine. I once matched with someone on a dating app, and it completely put me off ever using apps like that again. At first we got on quite well, well enough for us to have a date, but something about him and me just didn't feel like a great fit, unfortunately. The reason why I didn't think we would ever become an item was because he came across as a pretty weird dude. He was a little bit intense, you know, a bit stalky. 
full on. Unfortunately, he already had my information, so I would sometimes hear from him and keep in touch with him via an app called Line. I felt that if I blocked him, something bad might happen. He might fly off the handle. This guy had this intensity that was just haunting. I didn't want to provoke him. I know that sounds so dumb, but that is how I felt. Eventually, I stopped opening his messages. I just left them unread. After a while, he got the picture and stopped contacting me. I know it's not nice to give someone the cold shoulder like that, but he kind of left me no other choice. If I ever did reply to him, he would pounce on it and bombard me with messages at all hours of the day and night. He stopped messaging me and I thought that would be the end of things. I assumed that he had given up and moved on. However, one day, during a particularly cold winter in my city, something bad happened. It was freezing as I walked home from work. I didn't think that I could feel any colder, but when someone jumped out in front of me from some darkened alley, my heart felt like it was turning to ice. It was him, the guy I went on a date with months ago. So there I was confronted by the creep I had thought I had successfully avoided. I was really scared. He just stood there in my path and didn't say anything. He was glaring at me. And I was shocked into a silence. I didn't really know what to say at first. But after a couple of awkward seconds, I asked him what he was doing here. And he said something like, What's so bad about two lovers meeting? I mean, it's only natural I come round to see you, if I can't reach you by the phone, right? Shows I care. What he had said made no sense. It had been a good few months since we had spoken, and even longer since we had had our one and only date, it made no sense at all. I thought that he was obviously crazy, and then I thought about getting as far away from him as humanly possible. So fight or flight kicked in and I just ran. All I wanted to do was go home and forget about the weird encounter with that guy, but I realized that if he had met me on my route home, then there was every chance that he might know where I lived. I realized that it would have been totally dumb to go straight home. So I stood there as it snowed, cowering in some disused building's archway, frantically thinking about what to do next. After the adrenaline subsided, the solution was obvious. I needed to go to the police, so I went to my local callman. Hi, Jay here. A callman is a station for police officers built at key areas in the city, such as in front of train stations or in shopping districts. The word callman literally means taking turns to keep watch because police officers are stationed there at all times. And these officers, they take turns, shifts, or kotai in Japanese, to keep watch, which is ban in Japanese, ban, 24 hours a day. They make walking home at night feel pretty safe, and I have been grateful of their help a couple of times in Japan. Anyway, back to the story. After I made my report to the officers, they told me that they would patrol my area, just to be on the safe side. I felt reassured, but not exactly safe. And if I'm completely honest, after that night I turned into a bit of a recluse for a while. I developed an acute fear of leaving the house. Three months or so went by and there was no sign of that one date wonder I matched with online. So I slowly but surely regained some confidence. I went outside by myself for the first time in a long while. I was relying on the help of my friends and family up until then. I planned on heading to the supermarket. I knew the route, and I knew it was close. The Corban was nearby, and I felt it was a relatively safe route. In the word of a lie, I got about 20 paces up my street, and then I heard a voice call out to me from across the street. I was addressed by my name. It wasn't an oi or a cat call or anything like that. This person knew me. Here is roughly what the guy shouted at me. Hey, Kana, I've been waiting for you. He crossed the road with a light jog. 
and stood a couple of paces behind me with a completely straight poker face. Hey, you know you didn't need to call the cops on me, right? Don't you think that was a little mean, sweetheart? I was so scared that I couldn't make a sound. I knew I had to run, and I'm so happy that I chose that route I did to venture out for the first time, as I knew exactly how to get to the call van. I ran there, and I reported what happened. I have to say, life so far has been pretty incident-free since that second reporting. But that was how it was before. I feel like I have been lulled back into a false sense of security. I feel like it might be the calm before the storm again. Winter is rolling around. And the nights are getting darker. When the snow begins to fall, I'm scared all those memories of being stalked will return to me again. This happened pretty recently, and because of it, I will be quitting my job at the end of the month. My current job is to deliver papers to homes in the mountains, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's tough, because I have to start at midnight in order to get all my deliveries done. It doesn't exactly pay well, but it's good to be working, especially when you're young. It's nice to have your own money, right? Anyway, like I said, I start at midnight, and I don't finish until the sun comes up, and sometimes in the darker months, the sun doesn't come up at all. Being out in the mountains alone at night can be pretty spooky, as I'm sure you can imagine. I want to share my recent scary experience with you. It happened this winter. I'd gotten used to the rhythm of deliveries by that point. It was around winter time that the newspaper company I worked for was trying to expand their business. This meant that there would be more work for me, I was excited, at first, to earn a bit more money, but over time, it became more and more time-consuming. Basically, a subscription would come in, and then it would be down to me to deliver it to the customer. So I'm basically riding my bike around with a map, because signal is a no-go in the mountains. I don't mean a push bike, I mean a really low-quality motorbike, low CCs. The people who buy these subscriptions have an amazing ability to be unfindable. It never felt as if it was straightforward. I had one of these subscription jobs on that winter's night. I knew the address, and I knew it wasn't going to be an easy night. There were a few roads through the forest areas, and even worse was the fact that some of the roads were very narrow. I could barely ride my bike along them. I set off and rode my bike right up to the point where the narrow road began. Since it was winter, I figured it would be safer if I just parked the bike up and delivered the subscription on foot. There was a footpath after all. There was a post box at the end of the customer's drive. It was a short distance from the house. I started down the sloped road towards the post box, and then I froze in my tracks. I heard the sound of a dog barking. No. Not just one dog, it sounded like there were at least two. I thought not much of it, and approached the post box with the subscription in hand. It was still pitch black out at this point, despite it being the early morning. As I approached, I noticed a light turn on at the front door. There was an old lady stood outside under the porch. Seeing her gave me a fright. I thought to myself, oh wow. Someone super eager for the morning paper. I figured since she was out, I could literally just put the subscription in her hand. So I approached her. I stopped when she started yelling at me. Stop right there. What do you think you're doing? I'm delivering the newspaper and your subscription. The boss made us wear a uniform, and we had to have this ID card around our neck, as some customers, especially ones like this who live in remote areas, can be skeptic of people they don't know. Stranger danger. I raised my ID badge as I assumed she could see me pretty well. You expect me to believe that? You think that's proof? She screamed at me. I could see the dogs, especially the whites of their teeth. They were bared at me while the animals snarled. The old woman then pulled out a pair of long gardening shears or scissors from behind her back and pointed them at me. I instinctively backed away, 
I just tried to remain as calm as possible. I wondered if she was suffering with some kind of disease, maybe something like dementia. If she came at me with those long scissors, I planned on pushing them away or trying to kick her in the abdomen. I practiced full contact karate. However, she was an old lady. I don't know if I could have done that to her. I hoped that it wouldn't come to that. I just said, well then, I will just leave this here and be on my way. With that, I turned to leave. I didn't get paid enough to deal with this rubbish. I upped my pace as the old lady was still shouting at me. She sounded as if she was getting riled up. The dogs were really barking at me now. I turned to look over my shoulder and I saw her let go of their leashes. She was walking towards me, slashing the scissors through the air. She wasn't making any sense. I couldn't make out a single word she was shouting. It was time to run. I raced up the hill as I heard the dogs chasing me. I couldn't believe she literally released the hounds on me. I ran up the hill as fast as I could. I needed to get back to my motorbike. I got back to the bike, kicked out the stand and hopped on. I started the engine and had a look behind me. I saw the tips of the dog's heads coming up the slope and pulled away without looking back. It was really scary. To be honest, I think myself incredibly lucky to get out of there without any injuries. Those dogs wanted to bite me, I could tell. The old woman looked as if she would have joined in too. I imagined her plunging those large gardening scissors into my gut. I shudder at that thought now. After I delivered all of my newspapers and subscriptions, I spoke with my boss and told him about my close call. He decided that he would make contact with the customer to see what was going on. I could already imagine that he was going to take the side of the customer. It was just the kind of guy he was. However, he found that the customer's phone number was no longer in use. He decided to go out there himself and speak to the customer in person. I told him to watch out for the dogs. He said he would let me know how it went when I came into work next. I spoke to him the next day, and he told me that he went out there to meet the customer, but he found nothing but an abandoned house. He then made contact with the subscription company to find out why someone would want to send a subscription to an empty house. It was at this point we learned that the subscription company had fudged the numbers to make our company take their business. They wanted it to look like they had more customers than they did. They had a quota to fill, so they gave out a couple of addresses of abandoned homes. Stupid. Who the hell is the woman with the dogs then? I have no idea. When I think back to how hate-filled her face was, it gives me the shivers. Hence my resignation from my newspaper job. I'm working until the end of the month, so I hope I don't get sent anywhere near the scissor woman's house. I only have a few more days of work left. When I went back to my hometown last year, something really weird happened. It started when the neighbor across the street warned me that there was a suspicious person in the area. Apparently someone was going around ringing people's doorbells at around 1am in the neighborhood. My neighbor said that they ignored the doorbell at first since they were in bed as it was so late. Everyone in their house was in bed asleep. The doorbell kept ringing, so my neighbor's husband got out of bed to see what was going on. He took his phone with him so his wife could listen. He asked through the door in a quiet voice, Who is it? Is there some sort of emergency? Then a man's voice responded, Ah, I made a promise to Sarah. Can you let me in? There was no Sarah in the house or in my neighbor's family, and because it was a newly built house, there was no former resident called Sarah either. So he explained this to the stranger at the door and told him to get lost. But it's a promise. I... I remember it well, the stranger said. Well, I have a promise for you to remember. If you don't go away, I'm calling the cops, okay? The neighbor's husband called the cops anyway because the guy outside didn't show any signs of leaving. The police arrived quickly 
but the man at the door was nowhere to be seen. So the neighbor warned us to be careful, just in case he came back. We spoke about it at dinner that night, and I remember my parents were making sure everything was locked when the sun went down. Later that night, my dad and I were in the living room watching TV. It was just after midnight. The doorbell rang. I really didn't expect it, and I could tell neither did my dad. There we were, two full-grown men, afraid of the doorbell. Before assuming that it was the weirdo who called at my neighbor's house, I actually went and checked. We didn't have any way to check outside, you know, like those ring doorbells, so I crept over to the curtain. I pulled the curtain back just enough to create a gap to look outside. Through the gap in the curtains, I saw a man wearing a hat and a big dark brown overcoat. He was wearing boots as well. His face was hidden by the turned up collar of his overcoat. I couldn't really see his face. I watched as he pushed the doorbell again. My dad whispered to me to not get caught looking at the guy, so I immediately shut the curtain. This guy was definitely suspicious, there was no doubt. I mean you wouldn't want him at your door, let me put it that way. We decided to call the police since the neighbors were already worried about the guy. But until the police arrived, we thought we would keep him busy since last time he bolted. For about three minutes straight, he rang our doorbell. He was so persistent. My dad had had enough of this, so he went out to the hallway and approached the door. He stood before the frosted glass and asked, Who are you? I'm the guy who promised to meet Sarah. What's your name? Um, well... Is this an emergency? I promised Sarah I really want to come in. The guy talked in circles. Of course there was no Sarah in our house either. If you told him that though, he would just keep talking about his promise. It got you nowhere. He kept saying that he remembered his promise. While this was going on, I called the police discreetly. I wanted to see this guy get taken away but he left before the police car arrived. We then heard the knocking at the door. Police, the officer said. We have a door in front of the actual front door to our house, you know, like a porch. I was amazed to hear the knocking from the officer on our actual front door, not on the porch. When the weird guy was at the door, I was certain that the porch door was shut, and I didn't hear it open or close when he left. This door can only be locked from the inside. How the hell was that possible? I wondered. It creeped me out, but my dad didn't seem to care all that much. He calmly explained the situation to the officer. He gave a really accurate description of the guy too, and informed the cop that this happened in the neighborhood last night. The officer said that he hadn't seen anyone suspicious in the area. This guy knew how to get away and fast. However, there were footprints in the snow. The cops said he would follow them and see if he could find anything. He promised that there would be an increase in patrols and asked us to report back to him instantly if the guy came back. He cautioned us, said to try and avoid going out alone late at night, and to double and triple check the doors are locked. This cop wasn't a new guy. He was older than my dad and something about the situation had him spooked. I was getting very nervous. There was something very sinister about this guy looking for Sarah. My mother watched the whole thing. She was sat on the stairs. I turned to her and asked if she definitely locked the door outside the front door, that porch door I mentioned, and she was adamant that she did. My dad could sense our nerves. He tried to laugh it off. Don't worry, guys. Sorry we couldn't get him. After we all confirmed and were happy that all the doors were locked, we went to bed. I couldn't sleep much, but I was relieved to see a police car patrolling the area at around 3 a.m. from my window. The next day, we heard that someone else in the neighborhood's doorbell rang. My dad was really angry at the police. He said they must not be doing their jobs right if they hadn't caught the guy yet. Four more days passed where others in the area reported the late night doorbell rings. Everyone said the same thing. A stranger came to their door asking for Sarah 
and asking to come in. He wasn't caught. The thing I find weirdest about it is this. Not one person was able to describe what his face looked like. The stranger was the stuff of nightmares. I spent New Year's with my family and left to go back to my home, worried for them. About a week later, I called my mom to check on her and I got an update on the situation. The house across the street from us found a note in their mailbox that read, Sarah's not here, but I found her. Thank you very much. The letters were painted by a brush, like calligraphy. I'm wondering if we will get an apology letter too, or what it means if we don't get one. I'm sorry, it sounds like a mundane story, but imagine if it happened to you. A stranger whose face no one saw in the neighborhood, going around in the dead of night, talking nonsense, and trying to talk their way into your home. I don't like it. I don't like that he found Sarah, either. I got a job in the beginning of last year. It lasted for six months, and this experience was near the end. To start off with, I would walk home in the dark, right out the back door, because there was a stretch of asphalt, a small hill, and then a sidewalk path leading into my neighborhood nearby. Even though it was a five minute walk and through a neighborhood, my mother got me some mace in case of emergency for when I was walking home. Out the back door, there was a small nook before a small road on the edge. You had to walk forward and to the right to get to the dumpster, and there was a tiny parking lot in the nook to the left. It was a closing shift for me and another worker. I had a good relationship with him, and we considered ourselves friends. As it got time to take out the trash and clean the place, my co-worker started on the dishes while I took out the trash. We had quite a few bags, so I had to take multiple trips. I go out the back door and see a car. I'm really bad at car names, and it was sort of farther away, so I don't know the car name but I did see that it was lighter in color. The car's driving very close to the little hill at the end of the asphalt, and as I watch, the car stops and the headlights go off. I think to myself, well, that's not great. Better keep an eye out. I go back inside for the next load of trash, and when I come out, the car has gone from the edge of the road to the farthest parking stall to the left, much, much closer but the lights are still off. This is the point when I knew this situation was not good. So as soon as I finish throwing the bags into the dumpster and have gotten close to the door, I announce loudly that I'm getting my mace. Spoiler alert, this was probably what saved me. I grab my mace from my purse inside and then go up to my coworker and ask him if he will take out the trash with me because there's a creepy car in the parking lot. So we open the back door, my mace in hand. The car is nowhere to be seen. I apologize and tell him what happened, and he believes me, and still helps me out with the trash. When we're done cleaning and ready to go home, he offers to drive me home, and I decline. I ask if he'll walk me to the sidewalk, stating that I have the mace for a reason, and will use it if I have to. I get home just fine. After that, I never took out the trash without bringing my mace with me. I even remember warning another female co-worker that if she was taking out the trash, she could borrow my mace. I live in a pretty small town and I have a pretty quiet life, in all honesty. I have an office job, and I work some pretty long hours, so I don't really go out all that much at night. On the night that this experience took place, I got a call from a friend of mine. To be honest, I almost didn't pick it up, but I'm really glad that I did. She had called to say that she needed a ride. I didn't mind, I didn't have any plans. She needed to be picked up from a big supermarket, 
I guess that she had bought a ton of things and she didn't want to take all of that on the crowded train home with her. I was happy to help, but it seemed a little late to be shopping. It was around 11pm when she called. I needed a couple of things too, so I headed into the store to meet her. The supermarket was almost empty at that time of night, but it is usually really busy during the day. We got our things, paid, and headed back to the parking lot. I think that it was about midnight at that point. A group of men came out of a nearby game center. It's like an arcade. I think these guys came out because the place was about to close. They headed to their cars while talking to each other and looking over at us. My friend said to me that she wasn't feeling well and we decided to get going. We pulled out of the parking lot and a couple of the other cars followed on behind us. That was normal though. It was closing time, and the lights in the retail park were all going out. I noticed that my friend was quiet. I guess that was just because she said she didn't feel well. I looked over at her, and she looked pale. She looked at me and said, I think I know the guy in the car behind us. I didn't think much of it when she said that. I thought that it was just some coincidence. I went to look in the mirrors to see if I knew him too, and then my friend suddenly said, don't look back. I realized why she was so uncomfortable now, and I tried to pull over to let the guy pass, but then my friend snapped at me. She said, don't stop the car, whatever you do. I did as she asked, and continued. That's my ex-boyfriend. If you stop, I'm scared he'll come and try to open the door. Okay, this is serious, I thought. I made up my mind not to drive down highways. I wanted to avoid traffic lights, which would mean we would have to stop. When my car stops, the doors automatically unlock while the car is in drive. So I decided to take the back roads. And man, that was a bad idea. Thinking back on it now, I should have probably gone to a late night diner or convenience store. You know, somewhere bright with lots of people around. But I think that my friend would have freaked out if I even tried that. So I kept driving down these countryside lanes, the back roads, until my friend calmed down a little. The car behind was following every turn we made. The further we went from the city, the fewer cars were seen on the road with us. It got to a point where it was literally just us. The car behind was speeding up too, forcing me to go faster and faster. I asked my friend, why is this guy chasing us? And she said, I think I made him really angry. I don't want to stay at my place alone tonight. She then began to cry, and I didn't really get my answer. The situation we were in was getting more and more unnerving. I didn't know how it was going to end, and I didn't want to consider the possibilities. I kept driving. There wasn't much else I could do. But then something occurred to me. I had quite a small and light car, and the car behind was much bigger. What if I went down a narrow road? Maybe that would stop the guy from chasing us. He would be scared to damage his car. I decided to take that risk and turn down the next narrow road I found. I kept an eye on my navigation system to try and find a way back out of there. I didn't want to be stuck down some dead end road. I needed to keep driving or at least get to someplace safe because I didn't want to send my friend home in the state she was in. I thought about trying the police, but I knew that the police wouldn't do anything about the guy. It seems like they only help after the fact, never before. My friend was sobbing next to me, but she stopped to apologize for getting me into this mess. I mean, I should have sensed something was up. She hadn't ever called me for a ride from a supermarket before. She said she called me because she didn't have anyone else she could turn to. I told her that it was okay. I just wanted to know where I should be driving her, and she replied, don't take me back to my house. If we did just lose him, that's where he'll be waiting for me. Can you take me to the train station? I said that I could. But she could also stay at mine for the night. She vehemently refused. She said she had caused enough trouble. I realized something at that point. The stuff she had bought at the supermarket looked like she had been planning to run away. She even had some camping equipment. I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't fully understand the situation, but I knew one thing. The man who was chasing us was very dangerous, if running away from her life in our town seemed to be her preferred option. 
She said that she would stay in a hotel that night. She would get off the train far away and lay low. She was going to hotel hop too. Make sure her location changed every now and then. I felt for her, I really did. She said that she felt like he was always watching her and he knew how to find her. That's just so scary to me. I didn't want to ask about her ex, but I was curious as to why she was so scared of him finding her. I said something like, he sounds like a real horrible guy. And she replied, it's not just him who'll be looking for me. It's his group of friends too. That was frightening. Something really bad was going on. I managed to follow the narrow back roads back to the city and I got her to the station, like she asked. I was confident that he wasn't following us anymore. I felt for sure that he had given up. She got out at the station and we found out that the next available train would come in at 6 a.m. I couldn't leave her there for that long in the state she was in. I asked her to come with me to a McDonald's. I thought that we could talk things over a little, and I was right. She told me a little more about the situation and that ex of hers. She told me that he didn't take being broken up with very well. He attacked her. He made threats against her friends and family and tried to use fear to coerce her into getting back with him. He was also convinced that she had been with his friends. He said all this after she found out he had been on a bunch of dating and hookup apps. One of her single friends showed her his profile and she confronted him. She said that his friends are all a bunch of stalkers like him too. I was shocked and finding it a little hard to follow her story. Personally, I think they could have been as bad as one another with the cheating by the sounds of things. She turned to me and said, I want you to forget about me, okay? I'm not going to have anything more to do with you. I mean, it's very sad to lose a friend, of course, but equally, I didn't want to get involved with these weird guys and be chased by random men at night. I was feeling conflicted. She began to cry again, and she kept saying, It's really my fault this time. After dropping her off at the train station and helping her onto the platform with her bags, she turned to me and gave me 10,000 yen and said, Thank you. I'll always be grateful for tonight. And that was the last time I ever saw her. I had tears in my eyes as I drove home from the station that night, but they felt like they instantly dried up when I noticed a certain car in the lane next to mine. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had followed me earlier was still out here looking for us. I got goosebumps, but I tried not to make it obvious that I had noticed him. By some miracle, he didn't appear to notice me or my car, and after four or five pretty frightening minutes, he turned off in a different direction to me. As soon as I got home, I completely crashed out. It was the first time in a long time that I had been awake that late. Despite everything that happened that night, I'm glad that I answered her call. I mean, what might have happened to her? If I didn't, it's something I don't want to ask myself. I never heard from her again. Fast forward to three months later, and I got a call from my friend's number. I was really interested to see how she was doing, so I answered it straight away. I quickly found out that it wasn't my friend on the other end of the phone. It sounded like someone wasn't even using a phone. By that, I mean it was kind of computer-like. The voice at the other end of the line asked the following question. Hi, have you heard from my... The man calling from her number seemed to be polite and friendly. But I knew he was likely one of the guys who was chasing her and me that night. I was a little scared to say anything at first, but then I managed to say, Actually, I haven't heard from her in a very long time, so sorry I can't help you. Ah, is that so? Well, then I'm sorry to have bothered you then. And the call ended. I was so scared, even though it wasn't happening to me. I had a way to contact her through a separate messaging app, but I didn't dare use it, just in case. One of those guys, or her ex, had a way of tracking her messages. I hoped she managed to start a new life, and although that call was scary, it told me that they hadn't managed to track her down. If you are out there, stay safe, my friend. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. 
I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Yennefer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Ballard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marciana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardell, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, 
Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.